to be here. Um, very excited about this talk today. Um, <clears throat> so we're talking about the fixed stars. And this is a, a topic that is starting to gain more prominence as people uh, rediscover how powerful they can be um, when working with a natal chart in astrology. So some of the things that we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about, well, what are the fixed stars? What, what does it mean that the stars are fixed versus the wandering stars of the planets? Um, how are they different from planets? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the fixed stars and fate. So the, uh, the sphere of the fixed stars was, was concerned with more um, immutable divine law. So we're going to kind of uncover some quotes and some sources that talk about their role in Platonic philosophy. Um, we're going to talk about some delineation techniques today, where we're going to give you some shortcuts for understanding uh, the fixed stars and how to work with them in your chart, um, kind of how to think like a, like a fixed star astrologer. Um, we are going to talk briefly about some important stars that you can start with if you have a new interest in this topic. Um, we're, there are literally billions of stars in the, in the sky, um, but there are only a certain amount that have been really worked with uh, in some kind of prominence in the astrological tradition. So we will kind of try to give you a starting point because it's a, it's a vast topic. Um, it's, it's a topic that I even have felt a little overwhelmed by in uh in my studies so far there's also some debate about how to use them and what the right method of locating them in the chart and in the sky is um, and we'll kind of talk about that i don't know if i have uh, the greatest answer but we'll definitely understand what the question is um, and then hopefully by the end of this once we get through some of the slides what i'd like to do is i'd like to take you on a little bit of a tour of the night sky with a, uh, an astronomy program that I have called Starry Night Pro, so we can start to orient ourselves. So even though we're not together um, physically, we can kind of have a shared experience of going outside and looking at the stars and seeing how some of those constellations connect and feeling that type of, of power uh, of the unity of being under the same sky. All right, so if we were to def define the fixed stars, we could say that they were uh, the background of astronomical objects that appear to not move relative to each other in the night sky, compared to the foreground of the solar system objects that do. And those solar system objects are the planets. So the planets were called the wanderers because they change their position in relationship to one another, whereas the fixed stars, for the most part, stayed put. And we'll kind of break down some of the philosophical background on, on, on that and what that means. Um, there's also a word I wanted to define because it comes up in our talk here, the firmament. And the firmament is described as the vault uh, or arc or arch of the sky, aka the heavens. So this is, we're talking about the heavens that we're working with. Firmament can also mean a field or sphere of interest or activity. So in this case, our interest of activity is... Um, immortality, divine nature, divine law, uh, and working with um, some of the spiritual essences of the universe that give us meaning in life. So when we're working with the fixed stars, we're going to be trying to find um, meaning that will drive us and that the planets are going to be able to draw upon. A lot of the uh, ancient authors would describe a fixed star as like uh, something that was feeding the, the planet that and the planet was able to act upon some of the mythological stories and some of the essences that those fixed stars were providing. All right. So we'll go forward here. So this is uh, a quote uh, about fate. And this is from a book called Hamlet's Mill, which is a very interesting book that they talk about uh, the theory of potentially much of the uh, mythology of the world coming from observation of the sky. And they try, they give a lot of really uh, detailed arguments about how some of these myths over different cultures relate to one another based on an observation of a shared sky. So what we're looking at here, and I quote, it says, the fixed stars are the essence of being. 
Their assembly stands for the hidden councils and the unspoken laws that rule the whole. The planets seen as gods represent the forces of will. All the forces there are, each of them seen as one aspect of heavenly power, each of them one aspect of ruthless necessity and precision expressed by heaven. One might say that while fixed stars represent the kingly power, silent and unmoving, the planets are the executive power. Okay, so there's a number of things to unpack here. One of the things that I would like to draw your attention to is over here on the right, we have a picture of the goddess necessity. And here she is holding her spindle. Okay. And we see that there's planetary spheres here. And necessity was also called Ananke. And Ananke was the, the wife of Kronos, aka time. So we have this combination of necessity which is basically it means to compel something to movement. So we are compelling this movement with time to, uh, they described it as, the, as a serpent that was contracting and constricting itself uh, so that it would uh, squeeze the egg of creation and cause the world to spin. So here we have uh, necessity or Ananke with her spindle and she has these attendants. These are the Mo Moirai, uh, and they were the kind of the distributors of Hemarmene, and Hemarmene is a fancy word for fate, okay? It, it literally translates to that which is allotted. So we're talking about our allotment of fate over time. And the three Moirai had specific names. One was called Clotho, the spinner. So Clotho would spin the thread of life from her distaff, and, and weave it or spin it onto her spindle. And there was this really great talk by a very wise uh, astrological scholar named Dorian Greenbaum, where she talked about fate and the daimon. And she associated Clotho the spinner with the fixed stars. She called that the non wandering portion of fate. So we have two other Mo Moirai that we want to discuss. One is Atropos, the cutter. And so after Clotho spun the, the thread, uh, Atropos would measure it and would cut your allotted portion. And that was associated with the wandering portion or the planets. So this is where we receive the thread. And then the final uh, Moirai is Lachesis, the allotter or the apportioner. We can also call her the weaver. So she, would, she was associated with the sublunar realm. Okay, and we'll, we'll get to that when we talk about the celestial sphere model. But this is how we weave this into a life and how we are able to live out this fate. And that was kind of associated with like the, the elements. We were thinking of these mixture of the elements in the sublunar realm, like earth, wind, air, or earth, air, fire, and water. And ether was like an, a fifth element, right? Spirit that was bringing it all together. Now, Hemermeni was, was supposed to be kind of the fate that was less changeable than other types of fate. There are multiple types of fate in the Greek understanding of the cosmos. But Hemermeni were things like that you were born into, like your body, the family that you were born into, things that you couldn't necessarily choose. And we see this in this quote in Hamlet's Mill, that these are sort of the laws that we are having to follow. These are the things that we might not have as much of a choice over. Now, Dorian Greenbaum pointed out that we do have this quality called pronoia, which translates roughly to foreknowledge that allows us to, by divine grace or providence, be able to make choices when we are presented with some of this fate. And that had a little bit more to do with the, the daimon or the animating spirit. Um, but also we can choose to react to some of the, the uh, situations that the planets and the fixed stars bring us. So when we start studying traditional astrology, at least when I did, um, I, it really kind of shook my worldview up where it, I was starting to think more on terms of, man, a lot of our experience really is faded and, and we don't have as much agency or choice. And as I studied further, and that was kind of a depressing thought, but as I studied further and got further in my spiritual studies, we start to see that you know, even though we have uh, these situations that we're presented with, we can choose our reaction. 
we can choose our mindset. And so, some of those choices can lead to some different outcomes. We have some flexibility. So that is, that is sort of the ancient Greek uh, fate cosmology relationship that we have here. Okay. So let's move forward. Any questions so far? How are we doing? Feeling uh, good? We're good. Okay. All right. So when we are talking about the fixed stars, one of the things that we have to understand is the way that these ancient people saw the universe. And they had a geocentric model of the universe. So here we see a quote where we're talking about the myth of Ur. And so I will, I will quote. It says, in the fourth century BC, two influential Greek philosophers, Plato and his student Aristotle, wrote works based on the geocentric model. According to Plato, the earth was a sphere, stationary at the center of the universe. The stars and planets were carried around the earth on spheres or circles, arranged in the order outwards from the center. This is also called Chaldean order. Uh, the moon, the sun, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the fixed stars. Uh, so in this myth of Ur, there is a section, a section in Plato's Republic he describes the cosmos as the spindle of necessity attended by the sirens and turned by the three fates. So we've just gotten done trying to understand what these, uh, what the spindle of necessity is, what a non K is. And we've talked about the Moirai, which are the three fates. So when we are getting that understanding, we're looking at this geocosmic model with the earth in the center. Okay. And we have the celestial spheres that surround them. All right. Now, when we were thinking about the celestial spheres, the faster moving planets were thought to be closer to the Earth, the slower moving planets further away. And once we go through these seven celestial spheres that you can see here, we come to the firmament of the fixed stars. So they were beyond the planetary spheres. And they were said to be kind of feeding energy like the, a root system, right? to the planetary energies that are going to distribute fate. Now, outside of that, we have the zodiac. And outside of that sphere, we have the prime mover, which was kind of like um, the, the one god, I guess. So we have these multiplicity of gods, but we have this one kind of source that they're all drawing upon. All right. Um, I wanted to read you uh, some quotes from the Hermetica, because the myth of Ur was a powerful story uh, about uh, Ur, who was an observer of the process that happened before and after death. Okay, so this is talking about how souls come to be incarnated on the physical plane. So before a soul is incarnated, uh, it has to choose a, a token or a lot. And some, they called it a lottery, right? A lottery, right? And you could, you, you were given or allotted a choice of multiple lives. So you, you didn't necessarily get to choose all the options that you were given, but you, you got to choose from the options that were allotted to you. And in this myth of Ur, there was one particular person who chose to become a powerful dictator. Little did he understand that part of his destiny amongst other uh, atrocious things that he would do over the course of his life, that he was destined to, to eat one of his own children. So there was, it's kind of a, an allegory about uh, being, choosing wisely the type of life that you want to live and how you want to, uh, you know, how you want to deal with the purity or the impurity of your soul. And when a soul would incarnate, it would have to pass through these celestial spheres. It was assigned, it was, it was taking on some of the essences of these celestial spheres with the planets in different positions in the zodiac. And then it had to be assigned a guardian spirit or a daimon um, that would guide it through, through its life, okay? Uh, now, this story is echoed in the Hermetica. And the Hermetica, as you can see right here, is a, uh, is a book that is, um, it, there is some debate about how ancient it is. Some people attribute it to ancient Egypt. Uh, some people say it was given to us by Toth or Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Hermes. 
Um, others will argue that it came after Hellenistic astrology, about you know a few hundred years after that. Um, but regardless, it gives us some really interesting ways of thinking about the cosmos. And this is a there's a few stories about how a soul uh, will come to its destiny. So this is uh, the Hermetica on the zodiac and destiny. And this is page 80. It says, Atum, which is the, the creator, okay? Atum replied, I will build the zodiac, a secret mechanism in the stars, linked to unerring and inevitable fate. The lives of men from birth to final destruction shall be controlled by the hidden workings of this mechanism. When the mechanism began to work, the keen-eyed goddess Destiny supervised and checks checked its mo movements. Through this mechanism, destiny and necessity are cemented together. Destiny sows the seeds. Necessity compels the results. In the wake of destiny and necessity comes order, the interweaving of events in time. Otum implants each human soul in flesh by means of the gods who, encircle, who circle in heaven. It is man's lot to live his life according to the fate determined for him by these circling celestial powers, and then to pass away and be resolved into the elements. There are some whose name will live on through the memorials of their mighty handiwork, but the names of the many will fade into darkness. Few can escape their fate or guard against the terrible influence of the zodiac, for the stars are the instruments of destiny. All right. So that sounds kind of ominous, right? We've got kind of this... Uh, very interesting and, and epic, but also like, oh, maybe we're, uh, <laughs> you know, bound to this fate. Now I have another quote. This is kind of the turnaround. This is on page 102. And this talks about the ascension of the soul through the celestial spheres after death. Okay, so here is the little uh, kernel of hope. And I quote, at the dissolution of the body, first the physical form is transformed and is no longer visible. The vital spirit returns to the atmosphere. The bodily senses go back to the universe and recombine in new ways to do other work. Then the soul mounts upwards through the structures of the heavens. In the first zone, it is relieved of growth and decay. That's the zone of the moon. In the second, evil and cunning, Mercury. In the third, lust and deceiving desire, Venus. In the fourth, domineering arrogance, the sun. In the fifth, unbalanced audacity and rashness, which would be Mars. In the sixth, greed for wealth, Jupiter. And in the seventh, deceit and falsehood, Saturn. Having been stripped of all that was put upon it by the structures of the heavens, the soul now possesses its own proper power and may ascend to the eighth sphere. Okay, this could be the firmament of the fixed stars. Uh, rejoicing with all those that welcome it and singing psalms of the Father. The gods that dwell above the eighth sphere sing praises with a voice that is theirs alone. Call each soul to surrender to the gods, and so each one becomes a god, uh, becomes itself a god. By entering communion with a tomb, this is prim prim primal goodness, the consummation of true knowledge. Having been initiated into immortality, a human soul, now transformed into a god, joins the gods who dance and sing in celebration of the glorious victory of the soul. That's pretty cool. So a little bit of hope, right? Uh, I think that what they're describing here is that when we die, we have to pass back through these celestial spheres in this cosmological model to reach heaven, to reach the firmament of the fixed stars, to reach the abode of the gods. And we are stripped of all of the, the weight that we take on over the course of this uh, earthly existence. And, um, you know, the journey will be easier, the less of those things that you've accumulated, the less of those, I guess you could call them sins that you have accumulated. All right. So, all right, let's move forward. Now, this is a picture of the sun rising in the east, culminating in the south, and eventually it will set in the west. And this is describing primary motion, aka the daily path of the sun. 
So the daily path of the sun is one where we are going in clockwise motion uh, with the sun along the ecliptic. And I'll describe what the ecliptic is in a second. But due to its consistency and predictability, this type of motion was associated with the eternal and the divine. So this is important, an important concept to understand because we have these dual motions uh, in, in the, uh, the motion of the heavens, the one that is daily. And then we have planets that are moving counterclockwise in secondary motion. So if we move forward here, we can see that. Okay. So here, this secondary motion, is a, this is a representation of that counterclockwise motion uh, that is associated with the planets. Okay, so it says second, the counterclockwise path that the planets or wandering stars traverse when they are direct in motion. Okay, when a planet is retrograde, it's moving in the divine motion of the sun, of the solar motion, the primary motion. Because of its irregularity, this type of motion was related to the moon and the world of form in traditional philosophy. So this is something that relates to uh, spirit or daimon with primary motion and 2K or chance or fortune with the secondary motion. So like the moon, the moon has phases, right? Uh, as human beings, we, we come into a body, we experience changes, and then we pass out of form. So we can see that related to the motion of the moon over the course of a month. And those planets are, are trying to bring things into existence, all right, but they may be trying to bring certain divine ideals into this world of form. And sometimes they can sort of be at cross purposes. They're working against one another. So we have to think about the tension and resolving the tension between those two types of motion. Now, one thing I wanted to point out is that in this primary motion type of experience, we see fixed stars that rise with the sun. And we, we've thinking about that as like different 10 degree sections called decans. So a lot of the ways that we've gotten uh, significations from the decans in astrology have been because of the, the types of fixed stars and the mythology that was associated with those fixed stars and constellations uh, lend us a lot of meaning to those particular areas of the zodiac. So for example, right now, we the sun is rising in the first decan of Pisces, the first 10 degrees of Pisces. And there is a fixed star called Fomahal. Uh, in that Deccan. And that is that we are experiencing a, a conjunction with Fomahal today. And that was a, a, a wizard star that was all about magic and about, um, you know, kind of uh, charisma and things of that nature. So we are getting kind of the, a, a relationship with the wizard star today. So that's kind of a fun, a fun little thing. All right. Let's move forward to some definitions here. All right, so a few important definitions. Uh, one being the zodiac. What is the zodiac? Well, the zodiac uh, is a translation of the word zodiacos, which literally means a cycle or a circle of little animals. And uh, in our textbook scientific explanation, we can call it a band of the celestial sphere excuse me, extending about eight degrees to either side of the ecliptic that represents the path of the principal planets, the moon and the sun. Okay, so we're seeing here, the ecliptic is this green line. And this is a really nice illustration because on our Starry Night Pro program, the ecliptic will also be green. This red line here is called the celestial equator, which is a projection of the Earth's equator onto space. And the zodiac, it follows the path of the ecliptic. It follows the path of the sun. It was a, a band of constellations that were in alignment with this solar path. So that's an important concept to remember. All right. Now, there's some interesting features that we'll see when we get to our Starry Night Pro program. But when the ecliptic and the celestial equator cross, that is when we have equal day and night. And those are called the equinoxes. So at the spring equinoxes, the, uh, the celestial equator and the ecliptic cross paths. When the sun is at its highest point or its highest declination or, or celestial latitude here, that's when we have the summer solstice. When we have the sun at the lowest point in the sky, that is the winter solstice, okay? So we'll see this when we get to our program, but that's kind of the, the basic gist of it. Now, one thing that we really have to understand when we are looking at 
uh, the ecliptic and we're looking at fixed stars is that there is a concept called axial precession. An axial precession is the movement of the rotational axis of the astronomical body, whereby the axis slowly traces out a cone. All right, so this is something that has been a, a point of debate amongst astrologers for many uh, centuries because we don't all use the same zodiac, and that is really important. That's something that is a question that comes up a lot when people start studying astrology. The, the zodiac that we use in tropical Western, in Western astrology is called the tropical zodiac. And that zodiac is based on um, the zero degrees Aries point or the spring equinox. And then we divide the sky into equal 30 degree sections of the 360 degree circle. Okay, they're equal divisions, but it's based more on the interplay of light and dark versus the, the actual position of the stars and the constellations. That doesn't mean we don't take some meaning from the constellations, but these zodiacs do not match up. There is a, another zodiac called the sidereal zodiac, sidereal meaning of the stars, which they use in Hindu, Vedic, and Jyotisha. Uh, kind of an Eastern astrological approach. And this is based on the position of the constellations. Now they have this, uh, this system that they call a Yanamsas that roughly uh, translate to movement component that accounts for precession, precession being the separation of these zodiacs over time. And I, and I have a slide coming up where I will describe that in a little bit more detail. The sidereal zodiac is also an equal division of, of the 360 degree circle. So they have some kind of correction for precession, but again, those, those signs, okay, those houses for the gods, they thought of these, these signs as temples for the planetary gods to reside in and to, to do their work within. And those roughly can translate to areas of our life when we look at a natal chart, okay? Um, but they are equal sections. The last type of zodiac that we see in astronomy is the constellational zodiac. And the constellational zodiac is based on the actual size of a constellation, which are unequal in size. So one constellation may you know, be a certain size and, and mu be much smaller than another one. So like the constellation of Aries is much, much smaller than the constellation of Taurus. Taurus is a giant constellation. So these are, they're unequal. And we don't necessarily use those constellational zodiacs in astrology, although I've seen people who try. Um, I think that there may be some arguments that people in ancient Babylon or ancient Mesopotamia were using a zodiac that was more in relationship to the constellations themselves, but I can't necessarily prove that today. All right. That makes sense? Okay, let's move forward. So let's talk about precession a little bit here. So precession is based on the wobble of the Earth's axis, okay? So this is the, we're going to see the appearance of the fixed stars change. They do not appear in the same positions over time. Uh, and this is due to the Earth wobbling on its axis, like this gyroscope here. And it's moving the position of not only the pole star, but the other positions of, this, of the constellations against our backdrop of the ecliptic. So, you know, this, this movement happens roughly one degree every 72 years. Now, if you study ancient source texts, they thought that this movement uh, they had a really good guess. They thought it was about one degree every 100 years. So if you are re reading ancient source texts, they will have something that's slightly off, but our more exact uh, calculations rough it out to 72 years for one degree. That means that one sign, the, the equinoxes will, will take place within one sign every 2200 years. So we will have a, a one equal section of the zodiac, right? Uh, having the place where the sun will rise with that particular sign, okay? Now, this was important. Why was this important? Um, this was important because in the ancient worldview, the constellation, uh, the constellations, first of all, were thought of as gods. 
And the, the, the constellation or the God that the sun rose with at the spring equinox was said to be in power at that particular point in time. And they understood this, um, this relationship between uh, a God that was emerging from the underworld or from the, the, the below the horizon line and then descending below the horizon in the west, rising in the east, descending in the west. And we are emerging from the underworld and from, from death. And then we were going back into the underworld. So a god could literally die by going beneath the horizon, right? Or it could be born again. And this procession, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but they, they thought of uh, many, many ancient traditions, and they explore this in the book Hamlet's Mill, thought of the, um, the sky as a great millstone that was turning, and it, it somehow got off of its uh, spindle. And because it got off of its spindle, is this is how they describe procession in a mythological way. The, the zodiac started to split, and the gods were able to be to, to able to die, right? They lost some of their immortality. So this is something that we have to understand when we're thinking about like, oh, this is one of the ways people are describing astrological ages, right? They're like, oh, the age of Taurus or the age of Aries, age of Pisces. Um, there is some merit to that, I guess, uh, because we can see some, some of the spring equinoxes rising in different uh, signs. We also have a, a, a concept in traditional astrology called the Great Conjunctions, where Jupiter and Saturn come together. And we just experienced one of those in uh, December of 2020 at the winter solstice. And they happen roughly every few hundred years in different elements. So traditional astrologers would more mark out an age by the Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions in different elements. So we just shift from an Earth element to an air element. And that's actually a really big deal. So we may see some pretty significant changes. I think we're already going through it. I mean, look at what we're doing here today. This is very air element. Um, but one thing to consider, but I, when we when we look at Starry Night Pro, I'm going to take you on a little uh, time machine journey back to ancient Egypt so that you can kind of see um, this concept in action. Okay. All right. Let's move forward. That is procession. So one thing to think about when you're when we're talking about procession is that if you're reading ancient source texts, you have to move the the uh, the degree of the star forward uh, a certain amount of degrees. This is even true for like if you're working with fixed stars and you were born 60 years ago, that that uh, fixed star may have moved almost a degree already. So, and that makes a difference based on how we're going to use orbs and the positions and whatnot. So something to really understand when we're working with fixed stars. All right. So here's where we get to one of the debates over fixed stars. So we have a number of different ways that we can understand a star's position. And this is a topic of debate. Um, here we see two prominent astrologers. This is Claudius Ptolemy over here, uh, and this is Bernadette Brady. And we're talking about projected ecliptical degree and parans. And parans roughly translates, is, is a shortening of the word paranatello. And paranatello me, it means to rise alongside or co-rising. So first, let me describe projected ecliptical degree, though, because T Ptolemy in his great astronomical work, uh, the um, Almagest, the Almagest, uh, which was written roughly in the second century uh, AD, in book seven and eight, he cataloged uh, 1,022 fixed stars along with their ecliptic longitude and latitude. He identified 48 constellations, 12 of them being zodiacal. 21 of them were north of the ecliptic and 20 and 15 were south of the ecliptic. And what he did is he collapsed their position, uh, their uh, position in the celestial dome onto a specific degree of the ecliptic. 
So when we're looking at the sky, there's a 360 degree viewpoint that we have. But when we're looking at the ecliptic, it's just this one small band or section of the sky. So what he did is he collapsed that sky down into this band and said, if I project the ecliptic out into the sphere, we, I can measure these stars on a zodiacal degree. Okay. So like, for example, um, if we were to project the ecliptic out and where Fomahal is, that star is at about four degrees of Pisces now. It's not exactly on the ecliptic. It is a little bit further south of the ecliptic. But if we trace a line from the uh, ecliptic to Fomahal, and I'll show you when we get to our program, we will see that it is in alignment with it. Okay. Now, there's some real debate about this. Um, Ptolemy was writing in 200 AD or so, and there was a, a very important uh, document uh, called Anonymous 379 that was written uh, by a, an anonymous astrologer, but very much a real person, um, who was talking about the fixed stars and their use. Um, it, it was called the Treatise on the Fixed Stars, and we have uh, some translators, Robert Hand and, and Robert Schmidt of Project Hindsight, have a nice translation of that. We'll see a quote from them in a minute. Um, but they talk about using uh, the use of perinatella, to, perans, so let's just call it perans because that word's hard to say, the use of perans, and the difference in the use of perans based on this uh, newer astrologer, this more modern astrologer, uh, Bernadette Brady, who, it, who is, is very much uh, a luminary when it comes to popularizing or repopularizing the importance of the fixed stars. She wrote a very, very interesting and thorough book called Bra Brady's Book of Fixed Stars. And she uses this method called Perans. And what, what Perans basically is, is uh, the way that, that she describes it is what there are when a planet is on an angle, like the, the midheaven, the ascendant, or the descendant, or the, the IC, and another star is on a different angle, they have a relationship with one another, a Paran relationship with one another. Now, in Anonymous 379, um, they talked about using this type of technique for stars that were not in the ecliptical band. Those are called extra zodiacal stars, but they did not necessarily use that for stars that were on the ecliptic. Um, and again, that is a, a subject of debate. So there are many astrologers out there, including Bernadette Brady, and there's a few, few pretty uh, knowledgeable fixed star astrologers out there on Twitter that are doing some really good work that use this modern Paran method. Uh, there's some challenges associated with it, though. One of the challenges is, is that it's location-based. So the latitude of your birth will change the visible appearance of the sky. And if you don't know your, your latitude or if you don't have that a specific type of program that can tell you the exact position of the stars as it changes based on your latitude, it's difficult to work with this method. Um, I can show you some shortcuts, but again, when you're doing like a forecast for like, you know, the masses, you know, we've got different stars appearing in different uh, locations. So this projected ecliptical degree, I think, works potentially a little bit better for more generalized understandings of the way a planet and a star might interact. Now, again, there's going to be people that vehemently are in support of the modern interpretation of Perans. There's going to be other traditionalists that don't really use it at all. So I, I don't have a, a good answer one way or the other, but I think it's important to understand that that is a, a, some kind of debate right now that is going on in, in the world of fixed stars. Okay. All right. So let's move forward and I'll give you this Rob Hand quote. All right. A great debate is what this slide is called. And there's, there's Rob Hand right there, Mr. Hand, one of the, the great wizards of astrology. Rob Hand, in a footnote to Anonymous 379 in the Project Hindsight translation, says, uh, and, and this is after Schmidt had talked about only using parans when stars were co-rising with a planet. 
on the on the ascendant. Okay, it says, however, as used by modern astrologers, the word has undergone a major transformation. Paran now includes all ways in which planets or stars can cross the several angles at the same time. A modern Paran may include planet A rising, setting, culminating, or anti-culminating, while planet B culminates, sets, or anti-culminates. The original term used by Anonymous 379 and other authors refers only to co-rising. So those are fancy words for when a, a planet is, you know, on the eastern horizon, the western horizon, the, the southern culmination point, or the northern anti-culmination point. Does that make sense? When you are looking at the sky from the northern hemisphere, you are technically looking south, all right? The sun will rise in the east, it'll set in the west. When the planets are below the horizon, they are in the north, okay? So we'll, we'll, we'll get into this when we look at our chart. Okay, so delineation factors, all right? Delineation factors. So these are uh, some of the ways we can start to find meaning in these fixed stars, ways we can use them, right? So some more vocabulary for you. Uh, magnitude, all right? Magnitude. Magnitude refers to a star or celestial object's apparent brightness or apparent visual magnitude. Brighter stars are generally considered more powerful. So in our chart here, we have a little uh, a guide, right? This is a guide, a magnitude guide, where we can see the, the bigger the dot, the brighter the star. Okay, so Arcturus would be a, a zero to one magnitude star. Uh, the lower the number, the brighter the star, though. That's something to keep in mind. So a zero magnitude star is much, much brighter than a six magnitude star, okay? So this Arcturus is brighter than Spica. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that Arcturus is going to be more powerful than Spica, though, because Spica has another condition that we use to delineate, which is distance from the ecliptic. So this is the ecliptic, the path of the sun, that green line that we were looking at. Spica is right smack dab on the ecliptic. So it, when it comes in contact with a planet, it's going to really be drawing a lot of energy, you know, from to that planet, right? That planet's going to be drawing a lot of significations from Spica. And these two stars are roughly in the same projected ecliptical degree. If I were to project the ecliptic out from like roughly 24 degrees of Libra, I would go, I would be able to get Spica and Arcturus. Do you see how that works? projected ecliptical degree. So we, you know, as a, as a fixed star astrologer, you may, you could blend some of the significations of these stars. If you're a, a Paran's astrologer, they may show up in different places based on the three-dimensional viewpoint of the, of the cosmos. So some things to think about. All right. When we, another concept that came, comes up with fixed stars is uh, in uh, Ptolemy, and in subsequent authors, uh, these stars were assigned a, a planet or two that they were sort of like. Doesn't mean that they were, uh, you know, just that we can just reduce it to those planets, but they were trying to find ways to describe the essence of a fixed star. Now, I've read in certain places that this was something that the Greeks did later on in the, in the tradition and that did it retroactively. So I would take planetary nature potentially with a grain of salt, um, but it might be an interesting point of study to see if it really does work. Um, so in his work, the Amalgast or Amalgist, Ptolemy assigns one or two planets to a star to help us describe its essential nature. Now in one of my favorite fixed star books, the little book of fixed stars, which is a really great introduction to fixed stars. That's a really great one to start with if you want to just understand like some, some basics. Um, it's very well organized. And this is from a woman named Elizabeth Hazel, who is a local astrologer to my area. She's a really nice lady and does a lot of work with the NCGR group around here, the, her, our astrology group. And she states in her book, uh, The Little Book of Fixed Stars, she says, if there are two attributed planets, the order is highly significant. The first planet indicates the initial conditions or situations 
and the second planet indicates the outcomes. Okay, so that's that's a concept that I've only heard from her thus far. It doesn't mean that there isn't more sources for that in the tradition. There probably is because she is a very well researched, but that's something to really think about. So, like for example, if you have uh, a planet that is or a star that is of the nature of Jupiter and Mars. Your initial experience in the beginning of life or your, the beginning of your experience with that star could be one where you're trying to find order, which is one of the significations of Jupiter, where you may be trying to expand uh, and gain honor. But that action may lead to conflict. It may lead to a separation later on in the process of your relationship with that fixed star, Jupiter moving to Mars. So uh, this is a really, uh, really interesting way of thinking about it with the order being significant of those two planetary attributions. All right. Okay, one other thing to keep in mind is uh, when we're looking at these fixed stars, um, the, the distance from the ecliptic or the celestial latitude it goes up to the poles. We have these celestial poles and, and we have these certain fixed stars that are at the poles that don't necessarily appear to rise and set. That's why by people use them as guides when they were doing navigation. The pole star was a star that never disappeared. So you could guide yourself based on the pole star. Well, uh, currently our pole star is Polaris, um, but it used to be like Thuban in ancient times. And it, and it used to be, uh, you know, stars in, uh, that's a star in Draco. There was other uh, pole stars. The pole stars change because of that, um, that concept of like that top-like motion of precession, the wobble of the earth, the pole star will change as well. But that pole is 90 degrees of celestial latitude above the ecliptic, okay? See these numbers right here? So the pole is gonna be 90 degrees above this. Right. And the, at the South Pole, we have 90 degrees below the ecliptic. Okay. So generally, these zodiacal stars in some of the ancient texts talk about just eight degrees of zodiacal latitude, right? Eight degrees above or eight degrees below, and the extra zodiacal stars being in a different place. We could also philosophically think about, well, maybe those fixed stars that are in the ecliptical band extend all the way out to 23 degrees, which is the path that the sun takes above and below the ecliptic over the course of uh, a year. Okay. But it's, it's a way to measure where a star is. So again, the closer to zero that a star is in celestial latitude, the closer it is to the ecliptic. All right. This is also something that uh, to help you understand out of bounds, when a planet is beyond the path of the sun, it, outside of that 23 degrees and 36 minutes uh, path of the sun, it is said to be outside the realm of the king. And it is like kind of a maverick, right? It's like not following the king's rules, quote unquote. And that was a concept in traditional astrology about a, a planet that was not necessarily beholden to traditional rules and more of a pure essence of that particular planet. Okay. All right, let's move forward, 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 forward. One, one thing before I go on, one thing that's really come up uh, in Bernadette Brady's work, and, and Liz Hazel mentions it as well, so this is not just uh, unique to Bernadette Brady, is the heliacal rising and setting stars. Now, this is a little bit of a complicated uh, scientific understanding of the stars that I, full disclosure, I don't think that I have my brain completely wrapped around yet to be able to uh, give a complete understanding of it. But my basic understanding of it is that a heliacal rising star rises with the sun on the day or before the day of your birth. Okay, uh, it, it represents a star that is returning from the underworld, that resurrection theme that we were talking about. Um, the things that you bring with you potentially into life. This is the way Bernadette Brady uses it, almost like the nodes of the moon in modern astrology, like your skills. Like and maybe it, maybe it's associated with the the south node in the way that modern astrologers associate the south node. The things that you're bringing with you, right? Um, 
Now, I won't get into the nodes because that's not how my current understanding of the nodes is, uh, the nodes being those celestial dragons, the, the hungry dragon, the hungry severed head of the dragon with the north node and the, the dismembered body that is processing old things with the south node. That's the way that they understand it in the, the Vedic system. But the helical setting star is a star that has, quote unquote, fallen to earth, according to Miss Brady. She says that star is seen to set uh, before sunrise, returning to the earth after visiting the immortals in that area of the circumpolar stars, right? Those stars that never set, right? Sometimes that, sometimes stars will, they, they don't appear to rise like planets do. They'll just like pop out. Like the sun will go down and you'll see them. They're not like moving. They're just part of this immovable area of the, of the sky. And she associates these stars as uh, psychopomps, which were guides to and from the underworld. Mercury plays a role as psychopomp to and from the underworld, right? He was a guide of souls to the underworld. So she describes the helical rising as maybe gifts or demands of your life the setting as lessons that you learn over time. So that it could describe the type of lessons that you, that you learn after you experience your go around on this beautiful planet and you have your ups and downs of fortune and you make decisions and choices and see what kind of karma you create or, or that you resolve and, and whatnot. So that's something to keep in mind if you do get um, a Bernadette Brady reading or a Bernadette Brady star printout. I'll show you how to do that. Um, again, I, I hesitate to use Brady's method mostly because I don't have her very specific program that's only for Windows. Um, so that's like, I mean, that's really, it's just a practical thing. Like I have a Mac and there, uh, it would, I would have to jump through a number of hoops to make it work on my computer. Um, I also, uh, I will sometimes look at these helical rising and setting stars for a client reading, um, but I can do that through astro.com. All right. Also, the other thing about this that is somewhat challenging is when you're learning the positions of the fixed stars, learning the projected ecliptical degree, I think, can make it a little bit easier to understand where the star is and what constellation it's a part of. Um, and that may be a good way to, to have a, an introductory beginner understanding of all of this. Um, and maybe you branch out into to Paran, and, and maybe it's something that works very well for you. We'll, we'll, we'll see. It, it, again, it's a, it's a debate. Just like there's many different ways and, and, uh, to do astrology, there's different systems. My, the, the thought that I had when, about this type of debate is that, and this is something I'm learning from uh, reading Jeffrey Cornelius. Jeffrey Cornelius was an author of a book called The, the Moment of Astrology. And he talks about astrology uh, being oracular, right? Like where it was maybe influenced, not necessarily by specifically all of these exact locations, all of the, it may not be rooted in linear time, like we think about it, but it may be about an animating spirit that we are drawing upon and that we are working with to find understanding. And I think that that has really um, brought me a lot of softening of my attachment to technique in and being dogmatic about the technique that I use or don't use because I have three Virgo planets. Okay. Like I, I was driven crazy by all of these different methods of using astrological <laughs> stars and planets. And I was like, what, which one's the right one? <laughs> you know, like I got really upset about it because I was like, they can't all be right. And I was, and that, that might not be true. You know, like I think that there are multiple ways to be right. There are stories in mythology about different mystics touching different parts of the elephant. And they say, it's, it feels like a big tree, right? Oh, it feels like a giant snake. And, but it, you know, they were all touching an elephant. And I think that if we come at it from that perspective, that if the divine and the creator is all powerful, there's many different ways that it's going to be able to speak to us in many different techniques, many different ways we can observe the heavens and find meaning within it. So that's how I've resolved that, that kind of tension in my mind. Okay, let's move forward. Speaking of myth, let's talk about the power of myth. 
This is a really important part of the fixed stars. This is the fun part of fixed stars. Thank you for sitting through the longer technical part of fixed stars. Like I, I'm a, like I said, I have a lot of Virgo on my chart. I do think understanding some of the technical things will make you a better astrologer. Okay. If you understand the philosophical root of the technique that can make it easier to use it and to justify or, or discard something that works for you or doesn't. So I didn't want to just give you techniques. I wanted to give you philosophical rationales behind it. Now, when we talk about stories, though, this is the real meat of fixed star work, is how do we understand uh, these, these celestial uh, allegories, right? So each fixed star, it says, is part of a larger organizing pattern called the constellation. These ancient star patterns have rich allegorical stories that can help us find oracular meaning. Our oracular meaning being this space where we are in communication with the divine. An oracle is something that is speaking to us. So these constellations, these fixed stars can be speaking to us of some of the more divine, immutable laws, the less changeable laws that we may have to work within through hemermene and through fate. Not to say we can't decide our reaction to it, but there may be some things regarding stars that are a little bit more destined. Remember, we talked about destiny in the Hermetica. Now, one thing I would recommend is exploring multiple cultures. Uh, and this is true for astrology as well. Although I will say you can spend a lifetime in you know, dissecting one culture and trying to wrap your head around it. I've started with the Greek understanding of the sky. Uh, we have sort of standardized the sky to the Greek constellation. So I think that is a good place to start with your understanding, but there may be some arguments that it is based on a patriarchal view of the cosmos and that it discarded and maybe even made evil some of the more feminine goddess relationships that, that we see in different cultures. So I, I definitely would encourage you to get multiple perspectives on a, a cultural myth because these stories, um, we see sky stories in every culture. It's really interesting to see how we're connected through the sky. So it says, although we've standardized the sky with ancient Greek stories, many cultures have their own stellar traditions that are informed by their own unique culture and belief systems. Learning non-Greek mythos can greatly enhance your understanding. All right. So in their book, Hamlet's Mill, that I was talking about earlier, these authors, uh, De, De Santillana, I think that's how you say it, De Santillana, and <laughs> this is a Dutch name, Van Duschen, Van Duschen, I think that's how you say it, I'm not sure. They lay out an interesting theory that most of our inherited multivalent cultural mythology is based on observation of a shared sky. So the question that comes up in my mind as I was reading this book, is this Jung's collective unconscious? Is it the firmament of the fixed stars, right? Is it not just this random thing that we're tapping into? Is it, can we actually see that, per, that collective unconscious projected, maybe even if we're thinking about it in psychological terms, onto those sky stories. And this is why we can, I think, this is why we can see uh, myths that reflect uh, similar themes with cultures that had absolutely no contact with each other over the course of history because they're observing the same sky. They came to some similar conclusions about what these gods were in the sky. This was an ensouled cosmos. Before we got to Descartes and you know some of the, uh, oh, I don't know, what is, who is the, uh, the Copernican revolution, a lot of the ancient cultures thought of, of the cosmos as, as one world soul. And when we got to the scientific revolution and we got to the heliocentric universe, we lost a lot of that. And this is something that Richard Tarnas talks a lot about in his book, Cosmos and Psyche, about returning to an enchanted cosmos. So this is something that I think fixed stars can do for you as well, is help you to, to maybe feel a little bit of an enchanted cosmos. And we see this in this Ojibwe sky star map. Um, the, the indigenous people of North America have never have never lost that enchanted view, that worldview, that, that ensouled cosmos. As much as we've tried to strip it away as, as colonizers, we, you know, they've held on to that through, through their grace, right? So one of the things to, to think about is we can see an overlap of the uh, Greek patterns and the Ojibwe patterns. And here, here we see 
uh, Meng, which is the loon. And this is the Little Dipper, right? This is the Ursa Minor, right? Which in, in our Greek system, it's a little bear. But here, it's a, it's a loon. Uh, it was kind of had some correspondences with Delphinius, the dolphin, with the kind of playfulness and, and kind of some of those themes that we'll uncover. Uh, there is another uh, constellation that is not pictured in this picture. I had to choose, uh, I had to choose a picture. Um, and it is called the Bibun Kianin. And the Bibun Kianin, I hope I'm saying that right, is the winter maker. And this constellation looks like a giant figure that is extending its arms across the sky. Okay, and it's only seen in the winter months. It extends across the constellation Orion, the constellation Procyon, and its, its, its hand reaches right into the eye of the bull, Aldebaran. Okay, and there is a belief in Ojibwe culture that only stories should be told during the winter months. Uh, and that outside of winter, the spirits would trick you and make jokes if you were to, or things would go missing if you tell stories after the frogs have woken up. So I thought that was a kind of a neat little story is that we're only supposed to be sharing these stories while the snow is on the ground. Okay, so our, I think our timing is well good. We've got, I've got plenty of snow by me. I don't know about all of you in <laughs> Victoria, British Columbia. No snow at all? No? Oh, you have a lot of snow. No, we had, we had snow for a few days. It's gone yeah. now. It's coming, it's going around, right? It's yeah. going around. Okay. So yeah, we are, we're still in the midst of those winter months. And uh, yeah, I just think that there are multiple cultures you could study. There are Egyptian myths associated with the stars. There are Chinese myths that are very rich in, in their history and their meaning. Um, it, it is endless. It, 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 could, it could really literally take a lifetime to start unpacking the meaning over multiple cultures. We have Norse mythology that's associated with these. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. As many cultures as we see in the world, we have different types of mythology associated with it. So that's something I really wanted to point out um, because I think it's important to kind of go into it with that mindset. All right, let's move forward. All right, so here are some specifics about how you can begin to delineate the fixed stars. So we have certain themes that tend to repeat. So when you're looking at a constellation, there are multiple fixed stars within the constellation. So the first thing to do is to understand the mythology of the constellation itself, because there are rich stories that are associated with each of the constellations. And those stories are going to be prevalent be with the fixed stars themselves, with each of the fixed stars but they may have different meanings based on the position of that star within the animal or within the God or within the Titan. Um, so like, for example, we have hearts, like we have the heart of the lion is called Regulus and hearts are concentrations of the essence of that particular uh, constellation. So we may have this desire to be a ruler with Regulus, right? A desire for, for Leonine power a desire to shine brighter than the rest. And we may have to be careful with that particular fixed star. We'll talk about that one as we move forward. Aldebaran is the eye of the bull, right? So we, this is, could be associated with vision, eyesight, focusing on a particular goal or, or moving towards a more, maybe a more material uh, role as well or goal because Aldebaran is, is associated with the bull and the bull has associations with gross material reality. In, in the tradition. Uh, feet were important. Like if you had a deity, like here's Castor and Pollux. If you had a, a god uh, in the sky, if it's foot, uh, it, you know, there were certain places where they thought that the foot was touching the earth. And because these uh, celestial gods were immortal, they would sustain some kind of wound. So all, we have to use our oracular mindset of thinking about feet could be practicality, staying grounded, but it could also be about sustaining some kind of wound because you're having this earthly experience. Now, same goes for eyes and hearts. If you have a prominent fixed star placement with a fixed star that has to do with the eyes, your vision could literally be affected. This is something that people have understood with fixed star placements. Uh, one little thing to understand with the eye part is 
nebulas were associated with blindness because they were like these areas that were difficult to see. Um, we also have stars that kind of blink in and out of existence that are occulted by different stars. One of them is Algol, uh, one of the most challenging fixed stars in the sky. It's actually a double binary star where a, a dark planet or star is, I believe it's a star that is, is uh, eclipsing it. So it, it, was, it would appear to blink in and out of existence. And to the ancients, that was bad news. That was not good. They were like, this is some bad uh, <laughs> some bad, bad stuff right here. We don't like this. Okay. So just be careful um, with uh, stars that were related to certain parts of the body. So you can think about that in that way. Now, another way to, to analyze a fixed star is uh, what part of, this, of the sky is it in? Is it north or south of the ecliptic? A, a lot of the time we have binary stars that come in pairs, okay? And like Castor and Pollux are, are a pair star, right? Or two, are there two stars that are related to a similar theme? And we also have the scales of Libra being a pair of stars, Zubin el Shamali and Zubin el Janubi. One of them is north of the ecliptic and one is south of the ecliptic. Since they considered the realm north of the eclipt ecliptic to be more about heaven and the heavenly realms, and this to be more like the underworld or earthly, this is where a lot of monsters were, which was south of the ecliptic. The stars generally were more favorable or, or more thought of more positively uh, and associated with mercy too, especially with the, the northern scale in the northern part of the ecliptic. Whereas if you had a star that was in the southern part of the ecliptic, it might have been more challenging, more harsh. Um, this is seen in the uh, my, two of my favorite stars that I like to joke about on my podcast, the celestial asses. So we have the celestial asses in the, in the, in the constellation of Cancer. And uh, one of them is above the ecliptic and one is below. And the, the northern one was said to be one that Dionysus could ride, it like assisted Dionysus and in his, uh, um, when he was thirsty and, you know, fading in the heat of the sun, he was stuck in like this marsh or this bog and this, this donkey or this ass came and, and helped him. There's also a story about uh, Dionysus riding one of the celestial asses into uh, battle with the Titans, right? So, one thing that, to think about is the northern ass was easier to control. They associated asses with like, you know, unruliness, okay? And the southern ass, though, was like really like it, it would buck. It would be hard to control. It would take him off course and all of these things. So there's associations with that. Again, we see a similar type of uh, paradox with right and left uh, experiences of a star. In uh, Castor and Pollux here, we see Castor here on the right side and Pollux on the left, the right being associated with the light or the more fortunate or the more positive perspective, maybe, of a twin soul. This, these Castor and Pollux are the twins of Gemini. The left being the dark side, the more challenging part, okay? So you may have some experiences, like they associate Castor and Pollux uh, with storytellers. Castor may be a, a perspective. If you have a fixed star placement with Castor, you may be a little bit more positive. You may see the bright side. You may tell stories of hope. Whereas if you have a, a conjunction with uh, Pollux, you may be you know, experiencing stories that are a little bit more challenging, a little bit more difficult, where it be maybe harder to see that, that brighter side. Um, remember, one of these uh, twins uh, had to sacrifice part of their immortality for the other. Uh, believe it was, I believe it was Pollux that had to sacrifice his part of his immortality for his brother Castor, who was killed in another fight with another set of twins, and he just couldn't live without him. So instead of spending all his time on Olympus, he sacrificed part of his time on Olympus so that uh, uh, Castor could live again, okay? All right, so that is one way to think about the stars. Here's another. What type of creature is the constellation? And creature, we can also say what kind of deity or titan is it as well? Is it a monster? Is it a god or a goddess? Is it an animal? Um, is it a fish? Does it live in the water? Does it live on land? Does it have four feet? Or it, is it something that swims through the experience of life, right? Um, so serpents are, are something that we see reoccurring. And serpents being symbols of duality of desire, right? We had the serpent in the Garden of Eden that tempted Eve to bite into the apple. And from that 
uh, you know, experience humanity experienced uh, duality of opposites, male and female, life and death, all of those things. We can also think of serpents, though, in a more uh, relationship to the more feminine experience, a less patriarchal way of thinking about it, related to rebirth and purification, like a, a, a serpent will shed its skin. Um, so there is some uh, associations with immortality also with serpents and dragons, okay? Fish are interesting because fish are sort of the opposite of serpents. They represent that non-duality, divinity, the ability to move through water. Uh, and they thought of water as the water of desires. This was something that Oscar, Oscar Hoffman talks about in his fixed star book is he tends to really bring in a lot of Christian mythos in his interpretations, but he associated fish like, like a, a symbol of Christ um, and the ability to move through the water of desire unaffected, right? They, they never, a lot, many fish never sleep. So they're always kind of moving and they're always awake and they're always have this kind of awareness, right? And we see Fomaho here, uh, the mouth of the Southern fish now, this is a different fish than Pisces. Uh, we have the constellation Pisces, and then this is Pisces Austrinus. This is the southern fish. It's, it's at the mouth of, it's at the base of Aquarius, where, and you can see the water that's pouring out of Aquarius into the mouth of this fish. And Fomahalt is right at the mouth of the fish. So it's receiving all this wisdom, right? That's why we call it the wisdom star. It's receiving purification and all those things. And then we can think about horses and, and horse-like things. I guess I would also include centaurs in this horse kind of experience. Freedom, speed, uh, a wildness. Uh, the, the centaur was an interesting um, point of balance between our rational sides of the human part of it and the irrational, more untamed and unruly side of the, of the centaur, uh, which was represented by the horse body. Okay. The whale is interesting. The whale is, is a little bit different than we think of as our nice, placid uh, whales now. The whale in the sky was called Cetus. It was more like a sea monster. If you've ever seen Clash of the Titans, and that 80s movie with Harry Hamlin, uh, the Kraken is a, 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 a um, correlation. It's kind of a one-to-one -one correlation with, with uh, Cetus the whale. So there, that was associated with the unknown. Of course, the, the whale is south of the ecliptic. And it was like the fear of, of being swallowed up by a force that you can't see and things like that. Um, and it, I talked about bulls being associated with like material reality. It's a four-footed animal. It has four feet on the ground. We have Taurus being related to an earth sign, right? So um, other ways to interpret uh, our constellational myths. I'm going to try to, I'm trying to teach you how to think like a philosopher and not just telling you the meaning of these things, right? Like, like uh, our fish here, I want to give you the ability to fish rather than just giving you uh, the fish and teach you how to fish. All right, so these, let's talk a little bit about some of the, the fixed stars here. Um, if you're starting off your understanding of fixed stars, these four are really good ones to start with. These are called the Royal Stars of Persia. These are very bright fixed stars that marked out the ancient beginnings of the seasons, that marked out the ancient equinoxes and the ancient solstices. So Aldebaran is the eye of the bull, the watcher of the east that marked out the spring equinox around 3000 BCE. Regulus was the watcher of the north in the constellation of Leo uh, that is the marker of the summer solstice or the peak of summer, the beginning of summer, where the sun is highest at the, in, the, uh, in the sky. Antares is the heart of the scorpion or Scorpio, um, and that is the watcher of the west. It has associations with death since it's associated with fall and with the, the light um, submitting to the power of the night and the power of darkness, like underworld themes. Antares was interesting and in, uh, in Scorpio in general because the scorpion is on an opposite side of the sky as, as Orion and, and subsequently Aldebaran, right? So we have mythology of Orion being chased by a great scorpion and eventually like being killed by the scorpion because when, when Scorpio rises, Orion is setting, okay? So like 
because the scorpion is coming, Orion is being killed. So there's, there's literally visual stories that are coming up that inform the myth. Falmaha is the watcher of the south and, and a star that was associated with the ancient winter solstice. Okay, and I just described some of its uh, significations um, in relationship to Aquarius, the water pourer, and the mouth of the fish. So one interesting thing to note about the royal stars of Persia is that they are moving by procession, and all of them have now moved into mutable signs instead of fixed signs. They started off in fixed signs as the stakes of the sky, right? The, the, they thought of those signs, those fixed eyes, signs as the ones that held the sky together, okay? And now these, these, these royal stars have moved into Gemini for Aldebaran. It's at about 10, 9 to 10 degrees of Gemini. Regulus is now at about zero to one degree of Virgo. Um, Antares is at about nine to 10 degrees of Sagittarius by procession. And Fomaha is at, at about four degrees of Pisces. And so it's really interesting to see like how our, minds, our mindsets might have shifted uh, with these royal fixed stars moving into mutable signs. So like for instance, Regulus, instead of being in the royal sign of Leo, where it's about the sun shining its light and about this power, you know, maybe we will glamorize or glorify someone who is more skilled, some who, someone who is more humble with Regulus being now uh, in the sign of Virgo. So there may be a, a completely different mindset when it comes to like our shared, um, our shared, oh, understanding of how we want to craft the fabric of society. I think that's what a society is, is what are the agreements that we're going to make and what do we value as a people, all right? So they were the guardians of those four different districts of the sky. And certain constellations rose and set at different uh, times of the year too. There are certain constellations that aren't even visible in different seasons. Like you remember we were talking about the Ojibwe myth, uh, the winter maker. Like he's not visible after, after winter, okay? When spring happens, he's gone. He's not going to rise in as much anymore, okay? All right. So one more here. Now here we have another way of thinking about the fixed stars called the Bohemian stars. So these are 15 fixed stars uh, that were, are very popular in astrological magic and, and in talisman making. So it says Bohemian derives from the Arabic Baman, which means root. And remember, I was talking about the roots that were feeding the planets, the essence that was feeding the, the action of the planets. As each was considered the source of astrological power for one or more of the planets. Each had correspondences with gemstones and planets. They were used for ritual talis making, talisman making. Now, over here on the left, we can see uh, the 15 Bohemian fixed stars. And these are the sigils. These are magical sigils or symbols that, that uh, ritual practitioners will make or engrave on a gemstone when they are making a talisman or on some kind of metal associated with it. Um, and there's all sorts of various techniques of determining when uh, a good time is to, to inscribe your talisman with the power of this fixed star. There's a lot of debate on this, just as much debate as there is on astrological practice. Um, I believe that one method is finding out when the, the moon is conjoining this fixed star and rising on the, either the, the uh, ascendant or on the midheaven. Um, but again, there's lots of different rules and whatnot. This is something where uh, we saw this, a, a, quite an extensive treatment of this in uh, Agrippa, uh, which is a book called Three Books of Occult Philosophy, which talks a lot about these Bohemian fixed stars. All right. And they all have their different significations. Spica is, is a fixed star that is in the constellation uh, Virgo that we saw right on the ecliptic. It was the, the wheat ear. It was kind of the, 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 cons, um, the consolidation of the harvest, right? It was like every, everything good that we've harvested over uh, the course of our fall season or the end of summer, I guess you could say. And uh, Spike is a really lucky fixed star where you're, you, there's, it's associated with the gifts of, of harvest. Um, you know, we've talked about Regulus, Aldebaran, Arcturus. Uh, we have, let's see, Sirius is the 
a, is a fixed star that's in the constellation of the dog, Canis Major. And that one had to do with death and resurrection in Egyptian culture. Like it was associated with Isis and, and her ability to resurrect her husband, Osiris, after he had been killed by uh, his brother Set and split up into many different pieces and then brought together. So that fixed star has some associations with immortality. Uh, Isis brought together the pieces of Osiris to be able to give birth oh, oh, temporarily to give birth to um to Horus, the, the new god, her son. And then uh, Osiris went back to the underworld to become, to become the god of the underworld. And Sirius, there were associations in ancient Egyptian culture um, because Sirius, when Sirius was on the uh, rose with the sun, uh, that marked out the, um, the flooding of the Nile, the return of fertility to the Nile. So there, there's some really interesting associations with some of these Bohemian fixed stars. Um, Algarab was a fixed star associated with Corvus the crow. Um, and there is uh, a number of uh, constellations that add to that story. That's another thing I wanted to point out is that a lot of these constellations relate to one another and they are part of a, a, a collective story. So like, uh, for example, Corvus the crow was tasked by uh, Apollo to fill the sacred cup crater that is a constellation that's right next to it. And he was distracted by figs and failed to achieve his task, but he lied about it. And he blamed Hydra, who he is riding on the back of in the sky for, for the uh, failure to fill the cup. And uh, so there's some associations with maybe distraction, with maybe being given a sacred task, if you have a conjunction or some kind of association with Algarab. Maybe even a, a, a you know a, ne a necessary need to tell the truth if you feel tempted to be dishonest about something. So these are ways we can use these in a number of different ways. All right. So there are many resources for fixed stars. This is my fixed star book stack. <laughs> many of them that I drew. Uh, I drew a lot of uh, quotes and research upon. Um, I have not finished all these books. I tend to be, I have Venus in Gemini uh, right on the fixed star Rigel, uh, which is a, a fixed star associated with like the fire hose of information, <laughs> like which many of you have probably gotten today. It's, it's, uh, it, Rigel was the foot of, uh, Orion in the river, the Uridanus. Um, so a stream of knowledge, right? The journey to, to wisdom. Um, but I have spent a, a fair amount of time with each of these books. And I like to kind of, whenever there's something I need for my forecast, I will, if, if for those of you who see my forecast, I prep a lot for my forecast. And I'll probably go through at least five or six of these books and get five or six different perspectives on each star so that I can get a consensus or what I consider a consensus on their meaning. Um, so Hamlet's Mill is a great one to, to understand kind of the philosophy of like fixed star mythology and how different cultures may have treated it. Brady's book of fixed star is very thorough when it comes to, um, you know, the myth. I actually found out about Hamlet's Mill by reading the footnotes in uh, Brady's book. So I think that that's another thing. If you like a book and uh, you want to learn more, read, the, read the, the, the sources cited and go back and read that book and go back and read their sources. That's how I've learned a lot about what these books in particular. Oscar Hoffman's book is really good, although I will say it is rooted in that kind of a little bit more patriarchal Christian worldview. Um, but he has some really interesting ways of understanding the chart. And I want to give him credit for really pointing out the the necessity of focusing on different parts of an animal or different parts of the constellation itself. Star Lore by William Tyler Olcott is a very cool book written in the early 1900s um, that is based mostly on Greek mythology, but it's very thorough. I use that one quite a bit in my forecasts. Secrets of the Ancient Skies by Diana K. Rosenberg is this large two volume set here that is only available on eBay. So if you want that, 
it, her, she passed away from cancer a number of years ago, but her family still sells these books on eBay. They're not cheap, but it is, uh, it rivals Brady's book right here in thoroughness. Okay. So uh, as you can see, it's twice as big. <laughs> like she, she really goes in depth. It was her, it, that was kind of her magnus opus. And I think she passed away from cancer before she was able to, to really edit it the way that she wanted to, too. So if you want the fire hose of information type of experience, these books are it. But there's a lot of, a lot of interesting things to be gleaned from them. Um, star names talks about the, the kind of the how a star is named. It talks a lot about the Arabic roots of stars. Uh, a lot of the stars that we see like al Gol and al Debaran are, are, are Arabic in, in their nature. Okay, and this is uh, Richard Hinckley Allen, um, really goes into depth with that. Um, again, I, I really want to point out Elizabeth Hazel's little book of fixed stars is a really great, it's really tiny, it's a really great, like, you know, introduction to all of this stuff. And she's a local astrologer to my area, so supporting her is something I want to help do as well. Um, the amal amalgist, amalgist is that Ptolemaic work from the second century that we were talking about. 36 Faces is interesting. This is Austin Kopic's book about the Deccans. It's not specifically a fixed star book, but he does mention the fixed stars a lot in, in dissecting the Zodiac and how these stars rise with the different Deccans. It's not uh, in print anymore, but there will be a second edition that's coming out soon. And this star down here, this is called Pacing the Void. This is a, a Chinese mythological fixed star book. Here is an astrological magic book by Christopher Warnock that talks about the fixed stars. This stuff up here is astrological source texts. Um, this is Hesiod, Aratus, Manilius. Um, I believe these are some of the Homeric hymns as well um, that do mention the fixed stars in the fixed star mythology. So these are the lobe editions of these books, which are they're not cheap, but it's they do give the, the ancient Greek alongside the translation as well, which I think is kind of cool because I want to learn Greek eventually. All right. So those are the sources. And if you want to contact me, I have a, you know, spencermichaud.com is my website. I am on social media with Instagram and Twitter at Spencer Michaud. I do have a YouTube channel, Spencer Michaud Astrology. I put out lots of content. I make probably three or four to five videos a week that are 40 to an hour, 40 minutes to an hour long each, um, talking about planets through the decans and various philosophical con concepts. I'm on Facebook as Spencer Michaud Astrology as well. And here's my email address, spencermichaudastrology at gmail.com. If you want to reach out for a reading, I do have uh, a number of readings that I offer on my website, including working with the fixed stars and the decans. I really love doing astrology. I, I am solely a professional astrologer right now. I do a little bit of music teaching still, but I am 99% uh, professional astrologer at this point. So that's what I've got as far as my presentation here goes. I love that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Spencer. Yeah. And I've noticed your, your um, podcast has changed. The format has changed. You've gone from doing a weekly to kind of focusing on a specific um you know, something specific that's happening in the sky. So what kind of brought you to that? Um, well, the weekly forecast was a lot of work. And I was feeling like I just was grinding out the same schedule every single day because the, the like, like Hamlet's mill, like the millstone, the stars never stop turning. There's always astrology to talk about. And it's really, really difficult to keep up with. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wanted to try something new that was a little bit inspired by the way that my astrology teacher, Achuta Bhava, does his videos. Like he does shorter, more bite-sized videos that focus on a specific topic. But, um, in my attempt to do that, what I actually ended up doing was I started off with 20 minute videos, <laughs> <laughs> but as I went along, I just couldn't help myself. Yeah. Um, I can't help not being thorough. Yeah. And they started getting longer. And now I do four or five 45 to hour minute to four hour long videos a week <laughs> rather than just You're one right. hour and a half long video. 
yeah well we appreciate it so thank so, you <laughs> so yeah uh, that's and it's it's cool though because i mean here's an example though the planets don't all move at the same speed so like last week i made like four videos but this week i'll only have to make one or two because there's no decan ingress of a planet so right. I, I like that a little better because I, I tend to be a person who I can do a sprint, but then I need to like rest. And yeah. like, I think that, uh, you know, I'm a Leo ascendant. So I'm kind of like a big cat, like I can chase down the big prey and then I have to like gorge myself and sleep in the sun for <laughs> days yeah. at a time. Great. Yeah. You know? But, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, focused. Um, and right. I'm enjoying that a lot. And I had to do a real sprint here with this lecture too, because I, yeah. I had like four videos that I had to do. And full disclosure, I made all these slides between uh, 2 p.m. yesterday and 12 p.m. yesterday night, or 2 p.m. And, and 12 midnight. I did well, research before that, but yeah, it's, it's clearly years of research. But <laughs> yeah, did a yeah. sprint. Yeah, that sprint. Yeah, there's no way to for us to have known that. It definitely was well put together i think um, it turned out i think it turned out okay my, yeah my my uh one of my guardians here is like Shh, don't tell them that yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's okay <laughs> it it's makes not, yeah it's not really about when you put them together right. wealth of information of your expertise and your experience that is completely like awesomely visible in the in the way you're presenting the material so it's not about when you did it thank you and I think it's motivating to other astrologers too. Like when other astrologers are open about, you know, things that are difficult or things that don't always go well, it makes other people feel a bit more comfortable with, you know, how they're doing too. So. Yeah. You, you only see a certain facet of things when you get uh, an online persona, right? You only get a certain glimpse into the window and when you're making you know, four or five videos a week. Yes, I'm sitting down and recording for 45 minutes to an hour, but the research is multiple days of research before each video. Uh, I, I usually make at least a page and a half of notes for each video. Um, you have to make the social media advertising visuals for them. You know, it's it's at least an hour and, and some change after to promote it and all those things. It's a, it is, it's a lot of work. Um, and you're right, like being able to see that, you know, we're just human beings that, you know, procrastinate like the rest of you yeah. and, you know, like, yeah. I don't know if that's procrastination. It's just that, you know, you have to kind of prioritize things. And, and sometimes when uh, the planets keep moving, you want to be timely. So you, you see this fairly often with conferences too, because astrologers are making content that is, um, that, that has a shelf life. So this kind of talk is more evergreen, right? right? But you're you're trying to balance it out with the more ephemeral content that you're making. And there's always this like, well, once I get this ephemeral thing done, then I'm going to put more time in this, more time in this. And then, you know, by the time that th that never happens, do you know what I'm saying? Because the planets like, keep moving. They keep up with the yeah. relevant stuff. Yeah. And this is, yeah, I wanted to like uh, emphasize that this is the reason why we encourage people to really support our speakers and people who do this work because this is a lot of work. Like we in Astrology Victoria is saying, like we, we record videos, we put them out, we edit and 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 let alone like I'm, that I'm out of work. So the support that, that our astrologers get from the community is really, really important. And like we, we really stand by that idea of gratitude economy, at least I do. It's like being able to be grateful for the efforts of others and therefore give of ourselves. Um, and that's the reason why we uh, propose this model of, of donation base. But from that standpoint of like the gratitude that we have for our speakers and for the effort that everybody puts in, even if you made your slides yesterday, it's amazing that it's, it's the amount of research you've done and the countless hours of study and this is why um, it's very, very valuable. And um, that's why we encourage people to really support and hopefully support other astrologers and other things that you are involved with, because that's how we create a more, um, I, I, in my mind, a more supportive everything of, of a true exchange is very Aquarian too, you know? Totally. 
So yeah, so this is like amazing. And, and likewise, we, we like to invite speakers or if anybody has topics that are like you say, evergreens, because mm -hmm. since our astrology Victoria, we wanna, we, have a, we wanna put a lot of evergreen topics. Why? Because it's, it's content and then it's, it's available for everybody to learn. So if anybody that is like interested in, in really putting a topic together, with their expertise and, and their knowledge and, and their experience, then we're so open to welcoming speakers every single time with these interesting evergreen topics because it's phenomenal. Like uh, you said, Spencer, well, yeah, like uh, when you're putting constant like, you know, oh yeah, we already saw the Uranus, uh, uh, Saturn square. Okay, done, <laughs> when it's past, right. it's past, right? But the evergreen topics are really the core of what we, mostly do here in Astrology Victoria is to have this this almost library of knowledge that is like starting to stack with with the with the knowledge of so many wonderful people like I'm like blown away by the proportions that this could take with your support so yeah we encourage also people that are watching this maybe later to also keep supporting because that's how we you know. well I'll tell you a, a couple of things you can do to support the work I do is you know follow me on the social media right subscribe to the YouTube channel and the Facebook page and things like that. I have an email list that you can sign up for. Those are great ways to stay in touch and to support the work that I do too. And I love sharing my process. Like I'm, I'm not uh, the type of person that's going to try to, I guess, pretend that sometimes this isn't a struggle because I think that you learn through the struggle. And one thing that I, I did with the fixed stars and the decans is I would uh, earlier last year, what I would do is every time a planet would contact a fixed star by conjunction, I would make a social post about it and I would do, you know, an hour to two hours worth of research for it. Sure. Every, every, so think about that. That's seven traditional planets times, you know, 64 of the Brady fixed stars. So I was making like fixed star posts after fixed star posts. And I would do that with the decans too. I, I make a, I make a social media post um, and I design a really nice kind of like tarot association kind of like visual um, with every planet that moves into every single decan. And, and it's that consistency that helps you learn it. It's, it's a daily process. So like, you know, I would say that I really got interested in the fixed stars mm, maybe two years ago, like two years to a year and a half ago, but through being able to just every day work with them and every day try to understand what what's going on with them you know that's where you get to the point where it becomes a part of you and it becomes something that you can recall you know just while you're in a reading with someone while you're doing your forecast or something like that like and I love the stories I love the, the myths I look forward to engaging more with some of the other cultures, you know, but I, I feel like I want to really understand the Greek myths first. And then, then I'm going to ex expand out. I, I was given a gift. Cassidy gave me this really awesome book for Christmas, uh, which the ancient worldwide system. It's a, this huge book that is all these different uh, mythological stories. So she's been supportive of the work that I do here as well. And, and, really gave me some moral support yesterday when I was freaking out about my presentation. So thank you, Cassidy. Um, I want to invite anybody else to jump into the conversation. If you have questions, comments, feel free to come on camera or use the microphone. You are completely welcome to join in. And, and while I'm doing that, would you like to, uh, I'm going to click away from this for a minute, if you've got all, everybody got that. But yeah. while we're discussing would you like to see mm. uh, yeah. the, the night sky? Yeah. Okay. Can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, the view of the sky right now from my location around Ann Arbor, Michigan, looking south. And feel free to, to chime in, folks. Like, But see the green line? This is the ecliptic, the path of the sun. And I just wanted to show you this real quick because this is really cool the way that we can uh, see this moving over time. So the red line's the um, celestial equator, all right? We see the sun will rise over here in the east, okay? And it's going to be setting in the west. Now, all those planets that we use in astrology, they're all going to be going along this line roughly within that, you know, 20-degree 
latitude, right? Now, one thing that I think is interesting to watch is we can see the sun changing its, its declination or its height. So once we get close to the, let's do this at noon. Let's move back to noon. Okay. So this is when the sun's like, you know, at the midheaven, right? At the, at the MC in the chart, right? The 10th house or the 9th or the 11th, if you use whole sign houses, or the 12th, if you're born in Finland, because I, I have, we have a, a our, my, my, my good friend Susanna has a 12th house midheaven, which is really wow. interesting. Um, really cool. She was born in a very, uh, very northern latitude. But what I wanted to show you is that you can see that as we get closer to the equinox, the sun is rising, right? And we get to that point where those two lines cross. That's our equinox where day and night is equal. Okay. And as we move forward, we can see the sun's coming to that really that, that height. And we get to the, the solstice. Um, once we get to the solstice, we're going to see uh, the sun at its peak, right? There, there's our solstice point. We can barely even see it now because the sun is at its very peak. And then as we move forward over time, we'll get closer to the fall equinox. And you can see that these planets, they're wandering. They're changing position in relationship to one another while these stars are, are constant. You see what I'm saying? So we've got these planets moving. Like there's, I think that's, is that Mercury? Must be Mercury. Yeah, it's Mercury. Watch how fast Mercury moves compared to the sun here. And and compared to here's venus okay so watch this zoom mercury is just cruising right okay see now he's he's going in the southern declination he's retrograding back into the conjunction with the sun see that so it's going backwards it's going in the daily diurnal motion okay there's our kazemi moment around uh, october 9th what we missed though is here's the fall equinox and now once the sun goes below the ecliptic, uh, we are going to see the nights become longer than the day. And we see the firmament continue to, to spin. And when we get to the winter solstice, when we get to the winter solstice, we've got a comet that appears, which is pretty cool. And I don't know if I've heard anything about this, but I, was dis I discovered this when I was uh, practicing. I was actually, Cassidy helped me a little bit with practicing some of this and we saw this comet come up and we're like, holy cow, it's a comet. <laughs> like, so that's kind of cool. Um, but you can see that at the winter solstice, um, the sun is at its lowest point. The ecliptic is basically changing here. The, the path of the sun is very low versus very high, right? And then again, we'll get back to the, you know, the, the spring equinox and things like that. Now, one of the things that I wanted to show you is that if we go back to uh, 3000 BCE, okay, uh, and we go to Egypt, let's go, you want to take a trip to ancient Egypt? Yes, please. Let's go to Cairo. All right. So when we go to Cairo, and hopefully you will just Let's go there. There we go. So now we're in Cairo facing north, but let's change our orientation. Here we are in the south. Now, because of precession, those equinoxes are going to take place at different points. We can tell already where the equinox is going to be because we've got the crossing of the celestial equator and the ecliptic. And that spring equinox, let's go back to spring. Let's, let's get it. Let's see our sun here. Okay. So that spring equinox is going to happen in the sign of the bull. Now, if I were to show you where it was happening in current time, it would be happening, you know, somewhere around here, right? Because of precession, it's gone this way this the wobble of the earth makes this this point appear over here does that make sense now one thing i'll show you here is when the sun rises okay the the deity that was present was the bull 
So in ancient Egypt, they worshiped bulls, okay? But if we go forward, you know, 1,500 years or so, let's go to 1,000 BCE, you could see that at the, now I know the dates look funny, but the calendar is a little, it's a little different in, we have calendar shifts that happen over time. There's a Julian calendar and a Gregorian calendar. You can see that the spring equinox is rising with the constellation Aries. And there's, you know, there's literally biblical symbolism in the Old Testament that says, do not worship the golden calf, lay down with the lamb. So we have like, even like biblical stories based on some of these observations of the sky. And then when we get closer to zero or one, we're going to start to see the, now this is where people got this idea of the ages, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. Right. Wh where they're like, oh, it's the age of Pisces. It's the age of Aquarius. Yeah. Uh, now here, you, the spring equinox, the sun is rising with Pisces, the fish. And one of the symbols of Christ is the, is the, the fish swimming in opposite directions. Now, a lot of questions I get about fixed stars is what about the age of Aquarius? Blah, 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 blah. If, now, if we go back to 2020 or 2021, what, what year are we in? There we go. Okay. We could see that our spring equinox is in, still in the fish here. We haven't even gotten close to the Aquarius constellation. Okay. So if, if we were to think about this in that way, we'd probably have to go to 2800 CE or so where the spring equinox would begin to be in the stars, yeah. rising with the stars of Aquarius. If we're going to think about that as a, as a concept. Again, ancient astrologers thought more of celestial ages based on those Jupiter-Saturn great conjunctions in their elemental spheres. So of right? course to that, the, the, the great conjunction we just had is really what would correlate with that air era or yes. era, and not necessarily a constellation. Of yes, absolutely. Uh, so it, it, that's why astrologers have been making such a big deal about the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction because of its elemental shift, right? Okay, because of the fact that we are seeing the Jupiter, Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions happen once every 20 to 30 years, but this is the first one, albeit one little anomaly in the early 80s, okay, where we are going to see the Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions happening in air signs for the next 200 plus years, right. okay, and that that is really speaking to a change in our collective consciousness and the collective way of being human and our agreements we're moving away from things like the industrial revolution and moving more towards this digital age and this this digital economy like look at we're all in different parts of the world we don't have to physically be in each other's space to be in each other's consciousness we're we're literally commuting communicating through the airwaves or through digital ones and zeros it's interesting yeah. right and we saw the, you know, a preview of that with the, the personal computer, you know, being, uh, becoming prominent in the early 80s at the Saturn-Jupiter conjunction in, in Libra. And then we had a couple more Earth-Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions and then the internet just exploded. There, there is a theory of, there's a theory of these great conjunctions that Ben Dykes, uh, another uh, traditional astrologer, put out about mean conjunctions versus true conjunctions. It's, I don't completely understand the science behind it, but there's, there is a different way of calculating those conjunctions and the, the mean conjunction, the average of something uh, happened in like around the year 2000 when the internet really started to become a daily part of our life. So we could maybe even think that, that this age, the preview of this age started 20 years earlier, but it's not just like a one like thing where it's like, oh, now we're in it. There's a transition, transitionary phases, right? It's kind of slow moving. So the mean uh, conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn is what he's saying, but yeah, yes. that occurred in That's right. Okay. That's right. Um, yeah. You can see here, we've got all the, the 
constellations along the zodiac. This is Aquarius, the water pourer that's pouring its his cleansing waters into the mouth of the fish, Fomaho. And this had some associations with Hercules, right? This was could be associated with one of his labors. There's a, there was another talk I was thinking of doing about examining the sky through the 12 labors of Hercules. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this Aquarius is associated with the cleaning of the Aegean stables that hadn't been cleaned in like 30,000 years or something like that, or a thousand years, however long. And he diverted a river and like cleaned them all out. So that this cleansing of the past, right, is some of the associations with Aquarius. And we see that in the tarot decans as well, like leaving the past behind, deciding what we're going to discard. And now that we've moved into a sun Pisces experience, our attention is focused on how are we going to find meaning, right? How are we going to find a new animating principle or a new animating purpose after we've left something behind? So, you know, you've got Capricorn here. One thing I wanted to really point out though, too, if we go back to today, uh, I don't know if that, well, we'll get there. We're, we're in 2800 right now. A little off. Yeah. Um, what is today? That's fun. You can go anywhere to any point. It's super cool. It's literally like time traveling. Yeah. You know? Um, so today oh, we're in Cairo though. Let's go, let's go back. Well, it doesn't matter. Um we are oh hold on. I actually do want to go back. Sorry. Um I want to show you how to understand procession as well, real quickly. Okay. Because when we're looking at a chart like this, we are, yeah, see how this, the sphere is, is surrounding the earth, the celestial sphere, the celestial equator is projected yeah. out. It's really neat. Just kind of see it almost in this 3d type of way. This was literally my dream last night. I was going to see. <laughs> nice. So what you see with the fixtures, because it's something it was harder to, to see with the, not the 3D model, but the 2D model, is that the mm -hmm. fixed stars are like, they're, they're seen as an extension of like the degree is from the, from the ecliptic. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, like, so I'll show the ecliptic is that what how how it's calculated like the different yeah so so see this this is the north pole this is the north celestial pole mm -hmm. and we have to kind of imagine that it's three-dimensional but bef before i answer that and i and i this will help to describe that um this is the area of the immortals right this is the place that over the course of a day see how this is not rising and setting it's just spinning so those stars never rise and set because right. they're not on the ecliptic. So they're always going to be there, right? And this this is the spindle of necessity right here, the celestial pole that everything is spinning around, okay? And that's looking due north. Now, when we come back over here and look south where the ecliptic is, now I don't know where our ecliptic went. <laughs> the ecliptic. <laughs> we lost it. Yeah. Come back, ecliptic. There it is. So when we're looking at the ecliptic, all right, the we can see that it's we're always going to have to look to the south to see the ecliptic in the northern hemisphere, right? So this is we're looking south to see the path of the planets and the path of the sun. Um, but what we're doing is we are projecting these lines up to the celestial pole. So like, for example, right now, um, the sun is in Pisces. So I'm going to go back a little bit for a second. So here is Fomahal, and I'm going to hide my horizon. Okay. So there's Fomahalt, which is off the ecliptic, but it's projected down towards this celestial pole, southern pole. So this is however many degrees off the ecliptic right here. 
But there's another fixed star up here called Deneb LDJ that if we're projecting the ecliptic up to the celestial pole, it will be in alignment with that fixed star as well. Okay. But this is where the it's controversial because if you look to the south, you're not going to really see this. You know, you're not going to see it on the ecliptic. It's going to be off in some other direction. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's probably going to be up a above you. It's not going to be where you're looking. Um, also, you know, Fomahal is probably much more powerful than Deneb because it is much closer to the ecliptic. Okay. Like, because, you know, this is, this is the human path here. We're, we live the story of the planets and the sun. This is the animating, you know, vi vital principle of what we're doing here. And, you know, there is arguments to be made that these stars that are further up the ecliptic, are, it's a little bit, they may have less influence, right? Uh, Kat says, when you're familiar with your natal chart fixed star placements, should you then consider overlaying them, overlaying your current location, fixed star locations to see how they interact? Yes, I, I think that's a good way of studying. Um, I think that you can look at conjunctions in your natal chart. And then you can fool around with the, the Parans method that Bernadette Brady talked about. Um, I can also show you how Parans works on this if you want. Um, so I'm going to stop this for a second because I wanted, first of all, I know that Susanna was asking me how to do, um, she was asking me how to get your Brady report at astro.com. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is show you this real quick. So this is astro.com. Um, and what we're doing is we're going to the free horoscope section. And you can log into your account. Like you can get a free account. I, I have a paid thing, but that just allows me to save like a thousand charts or something instead of a hundred. Um, and you go down to extended chart selection under drawings and calculations. Okay. And that brings you here. And then you can go down and you can look at your chart. All right. So like I'm going to, there's me. And I'm going to, uh, this is for, we don't need two charts. We go to special under sections. And we're going to go to chart type. And we can go down and we can see parans and star phases. So here is all these different things. And you can do a, just a regular Bernadette Brady one. You could do Bernadette Brady with Uranus and Pluto and Neptune involved. And so I'll just do that one. because it's More information, the better, right? And you can change the house system to whole signs. It's not always more information, the better, but <laughs> that's how my brain works. Horoscope for Sophie. What's that? It said horoscope for Sophie. Oh, this is, okay. So this is my daughter's chart. Well, there you go. Now you can see her parents. Um, so then it'll take you like to looking at your heliacal rising star, your heliacal setting star. Um, I do, I want to go back though to mine cause I know mine better than hers. Sorry. Okay. So here is my chart, sun and cancer, moon and Taurus, Leo ascendant. If you're all curious, um, it shows my heliacal rising star, Alhina and El Nilum. There are two that, that rose. Now, again, there's a calculation with that that I don't completely understand yet, but certain stars, this, they, don't, they don't necessarily rise uh, the day of your birth. This is why this technique is difficult. You know, there are, I've seen charts where your heliacal rising star became visible 16 days before your birth. So I don't know how you're going to figure that out unless you have a special program. And, and that kind of thing sometimes bugs me because I don't want to have to always have a special program to do every single thing. But um, that's just me being weird about it. But when you're looking at this, what you're going to be looking for is you have stars in different uh, angles. So this is related to your rising sign. And they talk about timing in Brady's work, the star of your youth. And this is corroborated cooper in ancient astrology where some things associated with the ascendant are more about your, your youth. 
stars in the midheaven or the culmination of the stars of your prime. Setting is the descendant or the seventh house. And the lower culmination is like fourth house or third or fifth or wherever it is if you're using whole sign, okay? Like the bottom of the chart. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're looking at here is a, a relationship between a planet, the sun, where this, the planet is rising. And the second word is where the star is going to be. So an, an Al Nilam is rising at the same position as my sun, okay? Rigel is rising at the same position as the sun on the same angle. Now, in this case, Saturn is in the fourth house while Alhina is on the ascendant. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. In, in, uh, with Mercury, Mercury is culminating at the same time Castor is at the midheaven. Uh, Jupiter is setting while Ras Al Gethi is at the top of the chart. So there's like an angular relationship. So let me show you how this works in the, in the sky. So if we go back to our chart here and we look at Spencer Michaud's chart, July 7th. Y'all doing okay in there? We're not going off too long. Well, some, some of this is kind of interesting, but We're all good. I tend to be long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, so we got to go to Oak Park, Illinois too, because that's where I'm, that's where I was born. Now don't get too freaked out when, whenever I've gone to this, it's going to show all this junk. Okay. All right. So what we're looking for is we're going to look for a planet being on an angle and a star being at the culmination or the or at an angle i guess you could say so what we're looking at right here when i was born we're looking uh that's north this is pm come on am there we go okay so here's the eastern horizon whoops i don't know what i did there oh, well doesn't matter um so you see how this is the east, and the sun is rising here at 8.31 a.m.? Mm -hmm. All right. So one, this is a, an interesting concept, too, that I think people should really understand. Um, I'm going to put the horizon back in for a second. Because where do you think my sun is based on this position? in my chart. I know that you probably know this, but you can guess, but what house is this? If this is the ascendant, what is this? Right. So 12th. The 12th house. That's right. So I'm a, I am a 12th house son. Okay. So there we go. Um, yeah. And, and watch what happens over time. So if I move my son back to the ascendant, there's the sun in the first house, right in the horizon. And the sign of cancer, well, the tropical sign of cancer is rising over the horizon, okay? Tropical cancer has processed to the Gemini constellation. So the, the actual constellation of Gemini is rising over the horizon. But you can see that like cancer is my first house, all right. Or I'm sorry, Cancer is my 12th house. And the stars of Cancer are the tropical Leo now. So this is my ascendant, Leo, because here's my birth time. So there's my first house. And you could see that these houses keep rising. This is how the Deccans rise. So there's the rising over time. Okay. But we when we look to the south, here's our 10th house, right? Where the south culmination point is. Here is the seventh house over here in the west and below the horizon i'm not going to go there but in the north you'll see the fourth house so what we're looking for is when we have a paran relationship what we want to see is a planet and a, a star together so here's an example when um when saturn is rising capella is going to be culminating so what I'm doing is I'm looking at a 24-hour period 
here's Saturn rising. Do you see that? Saturn's on the eastern horizon. That means if I go due south, I want to see Kapala in the south. Oh, look, there it is. See that? Mm -hmm. Right. So that, that the fix of your, like, it's not your putting your ascendant necessarily at the horizon. It's just dependent on whatever planet is rising and then looking at. That's right. So, so Saturn is, is rising at 1131 AM on July 7th. Mm -hmm. And so it's for, a similar relationship between Capella and Saturn, you mean? Yes. So mm -hmm. yes, it's the angular relationship between those two, uh, the star and the planet. Now, I don't understand exactly why this works. I haven't done enough research to feel totally confident in it yet, but uh, this, this, this is the basic understanding of this. And you, you will see this like in all sorts of other ways too. Like, you know, for example, when uh, in my chart, when Jupiter sets, Rigel is in the lower culmination. So this is how I find this out in my chart. So I'm gonna go forward to Jupiter setting on the Western horizon, okay? So I'm gonna go over to the West and I wanna see Jupiter set. So there's Mercury. Okay, there's Jupiter setting, right? It's, a, it's going beneath the horizon. Now what I can do is I, logically, I know that the North is where everything is below the horizon. So without getting you all twisty tyranny, I'm gonna to go to the North because I can look under the horizon in this program. And what I want to be able to see is Rigel basically due north. So what I have to do is I have to hide the horizon here. And I'm going to see Rigel right there in the foot of the Eridanus, the river, basically conjoining the lower heaven, right? See what I'm saying? So it is an angular relationship with Jupiter. So that would be Jupiter setting. Um, so this would be a, a lower culmination, the hearthstone, she calls, of your life, where this is like the roots of your experience, maybe even experience after death. So like <laughs> with this, this placement, at the end of my life, I might get uh, recognition, which is a Jupiter signification for my knowledge after I'm dead, <laughs> like, which, which whatever, uh, leaving a legacy for, for people, I guess. You know, uh, there will, by the time I, if I go, keep going at this pace, there will be <laughs> decades worth of material online for people to, to, you will be like Ptolemy. <laughs> there you go. Right. So, <laughs> Who cares um, about like Ptolemy's dead, but we still like we're referenced. I, I can only hope that, that my, <laughs> my name will be uh, thought of in that, that way. Although Ptolemy, he's a, he's a somewhat of a controversial figure, but, um, <laughs> So we have a couple questions here. Okay, thank you, Tanya. She has to go. She's still in my house, so she isn't going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but where did she go in the house? You can hear me talk whenever. Does anyone else, does anyone else have any questions or cl need clarifications on what we're looking at here too? Because I think that that, you know, the sky can, we can get all twisted around a lot of the time when we're looking at the sky. And I just think seeing this visually, one thing that I would highly recommend is, you know, go outside and look at the sky too. I mean, there are programs on your phone that you can kind of literally hold them up and, and get a, a constellational picture from your phone of what you're looking at with the stars that look sort of like these pictures as well. But there's some, there's some cool stuff in here. And, and it just it, there's endless possibilities for the stories that it, they can tell. Like this is this is Altair, the, uh, which is part of the eagle Aquila, which is the the eagle that Zeus became a uh, took form in to be able to kidnap Ganymedes, the cupbearer. Ganymedes has associations with Aquarius as well. Um, so this was like you know associated with flight. People who have uh, Altair placements were like experimental flight people like astronauts like john glenn and like chuck yeager and stuff like that so like their destiny was to like be taken into the sky you know by a great eagle like their plane or a spaceship or something like that so yeah. there's all sorts of stuff like that that you see that's that's really that's really neat um 
Um, Kat, I see your microphone is off. Do you want to ask something? Oh, no, it's not. That's just me. Does anybody else want to come onto the mic? You can, or you can feel free to write your question in the chat, but uh, if you feel comfortable, you can definitely come onto the mic and join us. Um, my, I had a question actually. Um, when you're, um, when you're looking at someone's chart, or I guess just doing mundane astrology, and you're incorporating the fixed stars into your discussion, would you be blending its significations with the planets in a similar way? Or is it different? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well, let's think about it from a philosophical point of view. The planets are the ones that are like, uh, let's see in my, which one of these was it in my notes here? I believe it was like a tropos, right? The wandering portion. So this is someone who is measuring out your fate and then cutting it. And then the, the next uh, morai would weave it into your experience. But Clotho is the spinner. Clotho was associated with the, the, the fixed stars. So the fixed stars are more about the material that you're dealing with. Do you see what I'm saying? So you've got this yarn that you can then spin into a faded life, but it's going to be, the planets are going to have their own specific ways they're going to distribute that fate, right? It's because you've got benefics and malefic planets and you have luminaries and you have Mercury and you have the outer planets and all these things. So for example, if you, ha you could have a malefic planet that might bring out the more difficult side of a fixed star myth. So if you, let's say you have Mars on Vindemiatrix, okay? This is a tough fixed star. Right? Don't know what it means, but it sounds bad. So I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you Vindemiatrix here. So Vindemiatrix is a fixed star that is in the constellation um, Virgo. So here is Virgo, right? Basically, it was had correspondences with Demeter, and there's Spica right on the on the ecliptic. Okay, mm -hmm. actually, it's in the constellation Virgo, but it is in the tropical sign of Libra. I want I want to make sure that we understand that. Okay, and here is where is it? There's Vindemiatrix. Okay, now Vindemiatrix literally means. I believe it means uh, grape gatherer. And there was a story about um, a youth, a Dionysian youth uh, named Ampelos, who uh, was like a consort of Bacchus. Like he, he was like his, his buddy and our lover. It could be either one. And he was trying to pick grapes and tried to reach too high for grapes on the vine and fell from a great distance and, and died. And this was a really difficult for Dionysus to, to deal with. So there are themes with, with Vindemiatrix. You know, we, we can blend like Libra maybe being associated with partnerships and marriage, right? With, with death, death of a, a partner and death of somebody that we care about. And this is something that we've seen, um, you know, like, like if you had Mars, you may through a, a twist of misfortune because Mars is a planet of bad fortune that maybe bad things that happen that aren't necessarily your fault. Um, you may experience a separation from a, a cherished partner. Um, I have some clients that have some prominent Vindemiatrix placements that had uh, spouses pass, you know, so that's, that's something I've seen in a chart. Um, but let's say maybe we have a benefic planet there, maybe it is not as severe as like a partner dying. Maybe it might be softened a bit, right? Yeah. Maybe if it's Jupiter, for example, maybe Jupiter on Vindemiatrix. And I'm just, I'm, I'm spitballing here. I'm trying to use my oracular brain to think about this. Maybe Jupiter on Vindemiatrix might 
bring us a situation where we have to let go of something and we have to part with someone, but, but that brings us honor, that brings us a, a, a better experience because we, we parted with something. Yeah. And, and this, this informs the second decan of Libra, okay? Like in Libra 2, between 10 and 20 degrees of Libra, we have a, a tarot card, the Three of Swords. And that tarot card is all about sorrow and parting in relationships. So Vindamiatrix is bringing, is, is imprinting its energy on that area of the Zodiac right now. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that in ancient times, Vindamiatrix was in the middle of, of Virgo. Right. So that Deccan may have had associations with death of a spouse back in back 3,000 years ago or so. Do you see what I'm saying? In the constellation of... Right. So I think that the, the, I, what I do is I overlap the tropical zodiac and the fixed star placements. So I'm blending basically the constellational zodiac and the tropical zodiac for significations. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to see how the planet is going to uh, pull energy from the fixed star. It's pulling themes. I think that's the thing. The, the planet is going to be, remember the planet is a will. Yeah. And the, the, the star is like a canvas or it is like it is offering up uh, significations for the planet to draw on. Right. So we have the theme of separation, death of a partner, but the planet is going to like create its will through that. So like if the sun was on Vindemiatrix, for example, maybe you create a sense of identity through loss right? It could be through loss of like a, a marriage partner that could really have shaped your, your sense of self, your yeah. sense of awareness of, of what your meaning is in life, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. When you're with your clients, like, and you see things like vendomatrix or things that are really difficult, like, yeah. how do you address this? So not to like, you know how you can say sometimes that uh, thought creates reality somehow. Yeah. And by yeah saying something to a client like but you see that because it seems that the fixed stars can be very like yeah like the campus like this is going to happen whether you like it or not kind of and then the circumstances will make you grow or evolve as a soul etc uh, but in that sense like when you have a client and, and I think this pertains to all of us astrologers who don't want to like pre you know like seed a thought in somebody that then eventually will project it into like their consciousness or their reality. So how do you, for example, when you see that, how, how do you address those difficult ones? Because the cool ones are great. Like, oh, you're going to be famous or whatever, right? But, uh, but like the very- Well, and ev even those stars that speak to fame have a downside too. Like Regulus is associated with fame, but also those, those royal fixed stars have what's called a nemesis, where if you pursue power and fame mm -hmm. at all costs, you will experience a downfall. Right. So all of those royal fixed stars have that kind of flip side, that paradoxical side. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that um, I think it, it's a great question that you ask. And it's one that I've been asking for a long time. Um, I think that you're basically asking the question of fate versus free will on some level. And you're also asking, uh, how do we as astrologers, uh, right? as, yeah, as astrologers, how do we help our clients rather than do harm exactly right? and this is why I, I i'm curious as to how you you proceed because also you have a very in-depth knowledge of those things i mean we can see a saturn pluto's in you know in in charts and go like oh my gosh like you know but but with these kinds of fixed stars which it seems to be very faded right mm, um, sure so I, I think that um here's how i've approached it thus far so first of all um when I started studying traditional astrology, I went from more of a, I would say more of what you would, people would call a new age, create your own reality perspective to one that was much more like faded. Now that was one part of the journey. Okay. Um, because I, I, I'm a 12th house son. Okay. Like I've experienced traumatic events in my life that I did not ask for, okay, that weren't like necessarily my fault and that I just had to deal with. So I would say that I've experienced 
a lot of fate in my life that it was out of my control. Like, for example, when I was a kid, my parents divorced when I was very young and subsequently had multiple marriages to the point where I had like five or six different step parents over the course of growing up. Was that something that I created or was it something that was my hammer many that shaped my character? And so here's the thing. I may not have been able to control my parents' experience growing up. And I'm sure that that is seen in my chart. It is seen in my chart. I have Uranus in the fourth house, okay? I have Uranus in the house of family. It's instability in the family, right? Now, I can't control that, that part of my fate. But what did I, how did I use my foreknowledge and my pronoia to create an outcome when I was presented with a similar situation when I was creating my own family? And the story basically goes like this. I got my college girlfriend pregnant when I was 23 years old, and she had some serious mental health challenges, and we didn't get along, and I had to fight very hard to become a part of my daughter's life. And even though that blow of fate happened, uh, I had to choose through my pranoia, through my divine providence, how I was going to respond to it. And there was a lot of enduring, challenging circumstances. There was a lot of enduring things that were completely out of my control for many years. And eventually, when my daughter was a teenager, there was... Uh, a situation of abuse happening at her other house. And I went to court and I got full custody of my daughter. And it was very difficult, but it was a choice that I made. I, I had to make the choice to do that. Is it Was it fate that she was experiencing abuse? Maybe. But I got, had to choose my response to it, right? I had to choose what I was going to do. Was I going to allow it to continue to happen or was I going to step in and make sure that she had a stable place to live, right? And that is reflected in my experience of not having necessarily having stability when I was a kid. And, and that shaped my experience because I understand, I have empathy for what it's like to live in an environment where you can't trust your, the adults in your life. And by having that faded experience, I could then make a choice when I was presented with a similar experience, a similar choice, in my own life. Because here's the deal. When, when my mom and my dad split, my mom had a really serious mental health breakdown. And she sent me to live with my dad and disappeared for like two years. Okay. So I knew what that felt like to be abandoned. And I knew what that felt like to have a parent that I could not count on. And I did not want my daughter to, to feel that. So I got to make a choice, right? And when I'm talking to clients, uh, I like to say that the planet offers us the challenge, but also the solution. And this is something that I, I really have been leaning into lately. Malefic planets can bring us difficult circumstances. Mars can bring us misfortune. But what, how do we respond to the misfortune? Well, like Mars, you, you become, maybe you become separated from something. That's, that's Mars's energy is to separate and sever from something. But we get to use our courage to fight for that. Do you see what I'm saying? If we are separated from something, our response is we, we suck it up and we have courage and we say, we know this is going to be an area of our life that is not going to be handed to us that we have to fight for, right? And just, just like Venus is a planet of good fortune, where things may come to us that we maybe didn't necessarily earn. So Venus in a particular area of the zodiac may be bringing you things that you didn't do anything to, to, uh, to earn. But what you need to do is learn to open yourself like Aphrodite, who emerged from the ocean like a phosphorescent jellyfish and was adorned by the, the graces, right? We need to allow that part of ourself. We need to allow ourselves to receive in that area of life. And sometimes we block receiving because we're like, no, that's not it. We good like these interesting things will come to us. We're like, no, I don't, I'm not worthy of that. Right. So maybe it's learning to accept 
Same thing with, with uh, Saturn. Saturn is a planet that brings us experiences of being exiled. It brings us experiences of being abandoned, of being discarded, okay, living on the fringes. And you may have an area where Saturn is creating an experience of feeling like you are being put in exile, like that you just, it's harder to do. And it may be through some of your own actions. That's, that's the thing, because Saturn is part of the solar sect, which is more about our awareness, okay? Whereas Mars is part of the lunar sect, which is more about fate and about the moon. So we may have taken an action that, is, that necessitates a course correction. So I think of Saturn, and Saturn was related to a concept called a different way of thinking of nemesis, was Nemesis was also a deity in Greek mythology that restored right proportion through punishment. So Saturn has that energy of contraction, right? Of like getting rid of excesses. So when people go through their Saturn return, what they basically are experiencing is a, a course correction from the universe where they're saying, you know what? This has outlived its time. Saturn is associated with time. Maybe it's not your fault. Maybe it's just that that part of your life is no longer a reflection of who or what you are now. So when you go through your Saturn return, you kind of get a progress report of saying, did you, did you do the things that you were supposed to do? And if not, those things will become painful. Or do, are you going to mature? Are you going to use your endurance to uh, restore right proportion to your life? Like here's, here's an uh, example. And everybody's experience of Saturn is going to be different based on where it's placed, what sign, whether it's in the nocturnal or diurnal place uh, or, or sect, I mean, because if it's in the diurnal sect, you may, your Saturn return might not be as bad as if you're in a nocturnal sect, okay? But Saturn, my Saturn return, I'm a diurnal birth, which means that Saturn, my Saturn return was mixed bag, okay? Like it's, my Saturn's in Virgo and it's in the second house and I had to, I, I have a difficult relationship with money sometimes, right? I have a, I had a grandparent that owned a company that abused a lot of uh, things through capitalism and through corporate type of experiences to the point where it, in my youthful narrative, I associated money with a family breaking up. Do you see what I'm saying? Like that was part of the reality that I, associated with. And at my st and so that led to me not paying attention. I said, I don't want to deal with it at all. I'm just going to reject it. You see, like Saturn, I rejected this. I'm going to reject money. Okay. It's bad. And that led to me overdrafting my bank account all the time because I had no idea what was coming in and what, what, what wasn't. I had no idea of the details. I was denied an experience of being organized and a detailed analysis of what I had and what I didn't. And at my Saturn return, I had to like suck it up and say, I need a budget. I need to pay attention to what's coming in and what isn't. And if I don't, I will really suffer. Like I will, I was having experiences where I just could not pay bills because I was overdrafting my account so many times. So I had to grow up. I had to mature. I had to respond to the feeling of being exiled through my rejection of like dealing with that. And I responded through endurance. I had responded through patience and, and, incorporating it into my life uh, daily, small steps, Saturn moves very slow. So Saturn showed me the problem, not paying attention to my resources, and it showed me the solution, daily practice. It showed me like you have to restore balance to this part of your life, right? So I think that's the way, and we can look at that with like Saturn on a fixed star. Saturn's on a fixed star. That, that story may maybe a, a pain point, but through your intentional efforts or feelings, maybe even of punishment. Like I felt like I was being punished, but when, when that Saturn return happened, cause I was like, Oh, I have to deal with money. This, this sucks. This isn't fun. Right. It's everything that isn't fun about life on some level is Saturn sometimes. And, but you have to do it. There's necessity involved with it. Um, you're bound to it. And I think that 
when we have a contact with a fixed star, you may be bound to, to restore right proportion in your life through an experience of Saturn with that. Like I have Saturn on Denebola. You can see this here. So it's conjoined the tail of the lion. So part of the reason I may have been creating problems for myself is Denebola is associated with living a very unorthodox type of life of not accepting the norms of your culture and your society, right? And I was like, I'm going to be a professional musician. I'm, I'm a purist when it comes to like my understanding of like business, I'm going to do it for the love and I'm, I'm not going to sell out, you know, <laughs> like, but do you see that that mindset created an imbalance in my life? Do you see? And so I have to accept either, either I have to accept and really lean into being non, a nonconformist, or I have to understand that that could be something that is creating hardship in my life and maybe come to a balance point and say, I don't have to completely sell out or, or be a complete conformist, but there may be certain situations where I have to go along with the flow of society. And, and that was definitely true. Like being a parent, will do that to you. Like I wanted to go off the grid and live in the Canadian wilderness. I'll come up, up by you guys in Victoria and live on Vancouver Island or something. But since I, I was in a situation of co-parenting, I couldn't do that. I had to be part of society and I had to be part of the legal system and all of that. I could not reject society. I was bound to, to deal with it in a balanced way. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's fascinating. And like, I just have a last question because we're really like, maybe sure. to go. I mean, I could stay here all day. Okay. That's fun. But uh, like the last question is like, like in the same manner, like all, there's like, like thousands of stars, right? Like who, where does the archetypal signification come from? Like, like this is I guess, a very philosophical question and I ask myself all the time. It's like, well, so who decided that that was that, you know? Sure. And then patterned our belief systems and, and our ideas about reality. Like, well, this is a philosophical question, but I wanted to kind of like throw it out there to see just what you have to say about it because I have like absolutely no answer. It's more like something I can So question. you're asking me who God is or what God is? No, <laughs> you... no, no, no. More like... Go. Somebody, somebody, <laughs> let's, say, let's say I see a star and say like, well, I think it means that uh, whatever. And I make something up, fill something up, and then it's taken on by the system. Yeah, I, I think it, that, I think to answer your question, yeah. um, the cultures that uh, we come from inform our experience of these stars. Mm -hmm. I, and I think that there, one star may mean something very different to one culture than another. That's why it's really, I think that's another answer to your question of what if there's a difficult fixed star? Well, not every culture treats every star like the same way. So that could be one way to think about this. As far as like, how do we find this connected sense of meaning? Um, well, I could answer that like 15 different ways based on 15 different philosophical viewpoints of the world. I mean, the Greeks thought that there was a demiurge, like a, a creator, right? That Jupiter was one of the demiurges, really. Jupiter was taking some of the divine laws from Saturn and creating, bringing them into existence. Uh, and the fixed stars were some of the, the blueprints for this, right? Um, but that's just one philosophical worldview uh, I think that um, Richard Tarnas, as a more modern practitioner, would tell you that we are all part of the world soul and that we are all connected through uh, a divine consciousness, sort of like Carl Jung's collective unconscious, you know, like that there is some invisible force that connects us, at, at, you know, like a beehive right? Like, like, a, like a hive mind of some sort. And um, there's also a great mystery involved in all that. I mean, I, I think that I, I, I'm seeking those answers. And I have like a number of different ways I could describe it. But if you're asking me whether I have it figured out, 
I, I will, I think I'll consider myself a seeker probably for the rest of my life. I have too much mercury ruled stuff in my planet or in my chart to like, be like, yeah, I got it figured out. You know, I'm a guru or something. I, 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 I've said in the past that I kind of reject that type of thinking. I think of myself as a, as an eternal student and I'm more of a questioner. I'm more of a, I would say I'm almost a heretic on some level because I, I'm always asking the good questions. I, I, Sometimes it's tough. I've always done this to my teachers. I, I'm a little bit uh, irreverent. Um, maybe it's my Leo ascendant, but I, you know, <laughs> I feel like the only authority that I want in my life is is God. And sometimes I don't even want that authority. I'm like, I want to be the authority, <laughs> you know. So learning, I think that 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 experience of the twelfth house son has just been like being humbled in the face of the divine over and over and over again because of that approach. And, uh, but I always tend to ask good questions. I'm always questioning and saying, just like you, like saying, what does this mean? Why do we do this? Mm -hmm. And I think that really a lot of my journey has forcibly humbled me. Now, going back to Saturn for just one second, the 12th house in the tradition was called the joy of Saturn. So when you have planets there, I think sometimes those planets are, are going through that same Saturnian type of process of trying to restore right proportion. So over the course of my life, I had to restore right proportion to my ego, you know, with like the sun there to my, how I create vitality, how I create meaning, how I view myself. I have Mercury in the 12th house too. So maybe even the way that I use my mind. I mean, there are times when I get so paralyzed. I have a retrograde Mercury in the 12th house. I get so paralyzed by different options and different directions that I could go that I just suffer. So, so there's sometimes where I just have to make a choice and make a decision rather than constantly questioning. And that's a, that's a, res a restoration of right proportion by being in the 12th house. I think that's my way of thinking of the 12th. There, I've also heard some other astrologers say that this, was, this gave me some hope with those placements is that... Uh, Sometimes you experience 12th house experiences or the suffering of the 12th house so that you can help alleviate the suffering of others. And I, I definitely experienced that with my family situation. I, I, I would say that I experienced some hardship and, and some pain as a young person, feelings of abandonment. But that experience led me to try to alleviate the suffering of my own daughter and, and, and so on and so forth, right? So um, th that's you know, kind of the story of, a, of the Bodhisattva, where you may have experienced something and instead of ascending to some other level, which I, I'm definitely not saying I'm a, I'm a Bodhisattva or anything. I just like this story. I, I, you can choose to stay behind on a certain plane of existence to help other people through that experience. And I think I do that through my astrology too, is when people do a reading with me, I, I don't shy away from the difficult parts of a chart because I think that it is important to acknowledge somebody's pain and acknowledge someone's suffering. This, this experience on this earthly plane is not all quote unquote good. And we can even look at some philosophical worldviews where we, where they don't even judge things as good or bad things just are. I think that if I had to see a, a philosophical worldview that I would like to explore further, it would be maybe Taoism because Taoism is, is about the unity and the wholeness of experience where a new experience, like you may experience something that where uh, an increase of darkness always contains the seed of the light and, and an increase of light always contains a seed of the darkness and they're constantly flowing into one another. And uh, that concept really resonates with me. You know, like sometimes uh, when we think we're doing great good on the earth, we're actually sowing the seeds of evil. We, everybody thinks that they're the hero of their own story. You know, everybody thinks that, you know, Hitler thought he was the hero of his own story, mm -hmm. but he created a mass amount of suffering on, on the earth. So uh, it's, you know, same thing with like our president. Like, I, I don't want to make anybody mad, but like he thought he was the hero of his own story and society will probably judge him as a villain on the level of, you know, of many historical villains. You know, some people might not, but history probably will. Yeah. So I don't know. It's a, I think that's part of the, the mystery of it too, is there's a, I think that 
I, I don't think it's the, um, I think what matters is feeling a sense of connection. I don't even know if it matters whether it's the certain one story or another. It's does this make the hair on the back of your neck stand up? Does it give you this aha light bulb moment about something in your life? Do you get that tingle of recognition that you are experiencing something uh, meaningful, right? Uh, human beings, I think, are, I don't know, we think of ourselves as unique as finding meaning in life. I, I, I don't have the experience of a dolphin or an elephant or an insect, but I don't know if they create meaning the same way that we do. But I, I do think we, we may be somewhat unique in the way that we analyze everything and that are like, what does this mean? And, and that may be just a uniquely human experience. And um, I'm, I'm right there with you going on that journey. <laughs> Do you have Mercury ruled planets in your chart, Tatiana? Oh my God. Oh, yeah, it's my, it's my, it's my, it's my uh, like um, um, most prominent planet. Even though my ruler is Jupiter, I have mm -hmm. Mercury, Saturn, Sun, and North Node in Virgo, ten yeah. houses. So yeah. I get you. Like, yep. <laughs> very mercurial person, extremely mercury, <sighs> and uh, yeah, very strong Mercury very very strong mercury. well and the, the good thing about it having those virgo placements from my understanding is we're questioning things so that we can figure out what is useful and what isn't so we can discard the things that aren't and that, that's how i recommend going forward in your studies is if something is meaningful for you and you you find that 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 awareness of truth for you then it should stay if it's something that really just isn't resonating with you get rid of it you know like that's like with parans like I, I i'm curious about it but it, on a practical level it's very difficult for me to do uh mundane generalized transit work with a location specific technique so it doesn't quite work for me that doesn't mean that other people can't do really great work with it and they do I, there's there's some astrologers on twitter that are really they're, they're team Parans, and they, I've heard really good feedback from people who've gotten readings in that style. And I, I always say this too, as a mercurial person, I reserve the right to change my mind. Do you know what I'm saying? Because with new levels of awareness, and I've done this many times, with new levels of awareness, I may say, you know what? I was wrong. I, 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 that, at that moment, I only had this, the amount of light that I could uh, deal with at, the, at that time. And with more information, I have to be willing to, to shift. And I've done that multiple times with astrology too, especially. So if, if I do a deeper dive into like Bernadette Brady's way of doing things and find truth in it, then I might be, become team, team parents, you know, like, um, so who knows, you know, but yeah, I've got like, I got Venus, Mercury, or no, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, and Mars all ruled by Mercury. I got three planets in Virgo and my Venus is in Gemini. It's just, Mercury is a planet that th casts doubt on things. You know, we're always questioning stuff. And that's, that's why I, I probably say I'm kind of like anti-guru because guru is a little bit more Jupiterian type of experience. I have Jupiter in Virgo in its exile. So I'm kind of like, oh, I don't like that. You know, like- That makes perfect sense. But for some people, that kind of experience of the world works. That's why when I say I'm not this, that doesn't mean that what you are is wrong, right? It doesn't mean that somebody who follows that path uh, is wrong. And that's, this is, that's Pisces season, man. Just accepting people for who they are and where they're at. And yeah, we get a little uncomfortable as Virgoian type people in, the, in these waters. <laughs> but... but uh, but I think that over time, I've had to really drop my judgment of what is right or wrong and just kind of enjoy the ride, you know? Well, yeah, I like that. Pretty amazing. Well, we, I mean, we could well, go there. We could have a philosophical discussion. Yeah. Well, well, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to come back too. I'd love to do this again. Yeah. <laughs> starts with you very soon good, good. <laughs> that's already like in my <laughs> radar well and if any of you are interested in reaching out for a reading too I, I love spending time with people and and going over charts so i prep i prepare for a reading 
just as intensely as I do for a talk like this. So I really take my reading seriously and, and try to, I give a lot of information and, and really try to contextualize it and make it useful. You know, yeah. I don't want to just give information just to give it. I want it to be something that you can take and use in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'm super excited to be diving into the fixed stars now a little bit more. Um, yeah. And I, I don't think I've ever gotten a reading from you. I think I definitely will <laughs> look into that a little. That yeah. sounds like a great idea. Um, because, yeah, just like listening to you combining the the planets with one of the fixed stars, it just it makes a lot of sense, and it gives a much broader uh, picture of what it's saying. So, well, what I like to call it is integrative divination. So, when you do a, a lot of times when people come to me for a reading, I'll do fixed stars, I'll do their natal chart, I will talk about the tarot cards associated with those placements. And I'll do like I Ching with it as well. I, I love the I Ching as an oracle. I Ching brings a lot of clarity to, to a natal chart sometimes. So like I said, I don't think that, that the divine really cares what frequency you tune into. I think, think about it as like a radio uh, signal and you, we are the receivers. And are we going to tune in to the different radio signal? Like, and that's what, that's what we're doing here with astrology. We're tuning into the, the signal of astrology and then the divine can speak to us through that. And by coming, becoming aware of the fixed stars or becoming aware of animal symbolism or the I Ching, you've tuned into that frequency. I just happen to have a brain that likes to hear all the frequencies at once and <laughs> can somehow make that into something coherent. That, I think that's J Jupiter and Virgo's gift is yeah. I can take multiple things and make it into something, you know, cohesive because yeah. Jupiter brings things together. So I will take all the different details and I will try to unify it into something that will be useful. Yeah. Very necessary. Yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have to do that. <laughs> there's a lot of noise out there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so, so much, Spencer. Yeah, this was fun. We got so much out of that. That was... Yeah. Like if anybody uh, wants to say anything or say goodbye, please feel free also to open your mics. Like thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, this and was thank cool. You, thanks to everyone for joining. And thank you to Cassidy who who showed up today for being my moral support. And she has a lot of Virgo stuff in her chart, and she's a great editor, and is able to give me a lot of focus. Sometimes I, she helped me uh, at another talk I did to really pare things down and focus. So yeah, Mercury and Virgo, she's got an awesome Mercury. So if you ever need like moral support on, a, on like a talk, if your brain's too confused, reach out to Cassidy for, Thanks, Cassidy. for, for expertise. But, <laughs> and thank you to Susanna from Finland for coming. She's been a great supporter of my work and, and I really enjoy my conversations with her as well. We have a son that's at a similar degree. So we have a lot, a lot of similar experiences. Like, and thank you to the rest of you that, that have showed up and are supporting what we're doing here. Well, we hope to, to hear more from you. So if any, like, please, everybody who came or who's watching this, like, later, like, um, this is just amazing information. So keep just passing on, sharing. This is, this makes it even bigger, brighter, better for everyone. <laughs> That's <laughs> good. Thank you. So All thank right, you. Yeah. And we'll see you. Uh, well, hope to get a reading very soon from you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks so everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye.